Hello, welcome to Mind Chat. I'm Philip Goff. Hello, welcome. I'm Keith Frankish. How are you doing, Keith? What's going on? I'm good. Uh, what's going on? Ah, well, uh, in in Greece, it looks like we're heading towards another lockdown, actually. Oh, really? Uh, oh, God. So um, um, there's quite a lot of a lo quite a lot of family uh, stresses over school and that sort of thing. Um, otherwise. And busy plugging away, solving the problems of consciousness. Well, uh, how about you? Um, all right, just but quite busy getting ready to go off to the US next week to do a ah. Joe Rogan podcast and Lex ah. Friedman. And because I'm teaching, I'm just going a few days, do that, come back. And so a little bit hectic, but I'll have to listen into that. Will it be on the will it be broadcast on, um, on the internet? Yeah, it's coming out the next day, actually. Yeah, I think so. Oh no, oh, no, no. It's in our. They just do it on Spotify, don't they? On Spotify, but that—that that is the internet, isn't it? I oh, I guess. <laughs> I must listen into that. Um, so, should we do a quick roundup of what's coming up before we bring in our distinguished guest? Um, so, we've got um, Christmas special next month. I haven't got an exact date pinned down for that. It's going to be an Ask Me Anything. And we've got a guest. Uh, we've got a guest um, uh, host, haven't we? Yes, Nathan Orman from the uh, Digital Gnosis Channel, very good philosophy channel, has kindly offered to host that uh, probe because we've never had anyone on with our views, really, have we? So, so he can probe our views a little bit, and we can have a little bit of a chat. Wearing Christmas jumpers, sherry, <laughs> mince pies, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, yeah. Should be fun. And then we got a uh, new year. We've got David Chalmers talking about his new book on virtual reality and the problems of philosophy. February, David Papineau, another philosopher, materialist philosopher. We're talking about his new book on perception. Um, Helen Stewart and free will, free will in March. And Sophie Barwich on uh, the philosophy, neuroscience and philosophy of smell in April. And then Angela Mendelevici in may on uh the relationship between thought and consciousness it's a great so, lineup um uh, this is us this this is the first episode of our second series isn't it this one today oh yeah forgot about that season two we should series have uh, we should have had some big explosions or something <laughs> well, we didn't end on a cliffhanger that's the trouble you see we should have ended you know with like sort of you know being kidnapped by the borg or something and then yeah you know what would happen but we didn't uh too late now Make an, can you make a note of that for next time? End, end season two with a cliffhanger so we can. Yeah. So anyway, if you do, if you're watching, do subscribe to help get the content out there and comment and so on. But today we've got a very special guest. Very pleased to welcome the physicist Sean Carroll. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome. Uh, Thanks for having me. Sean is... Um, a research physicist at California Institute of Technology, author of many books, including fantastic big philosophy physics book, The Big Picture, and more recently, Something Deeply Hidden, The uh, Defense of the Many Worlds, Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics. Uh, thanks for joining us. No, this should be a lot of fun. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Anything else we missed out there? Anything you'd like to share about your existence that... My existence, my existence uh, continues for a little while. <laughs> Although, you know, I guess that depends on your attitude towards higher level emergent phenomena. But I, I, I do think I'm still existing. Yes. Glad to hear it. Okay, so we normally we normally start by um, asking our guests how they started thinking about consciousness, and I would like to ask you that because I think you do think about consciousness. But I'd like to first ask you how you first start th started thinking about physics. How I started thinking about physics. Yeah, what well, first that got was you a long physics. time ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I actually you know, I've been right. asked this many times, and I don't know the exact moment. I there's, there was no sort of pinpointing of uh, an epiphany, but it was very young. I was I was uh, circa ten years old when I started hanging out at our local public library and reading all the books about black holes and particle physics and the Big Bang and general relativity. And I decided that's what I wanted to think about for a living. Uh, and here I am doing it. Uh, so it was, I don't recommend deciding what you want to do for your life when you're 10 years old. Like, what do you know? But uh, it was worked yeah. out okay for me. 
Very good, very good. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to be a physicist actually at one point when I was about ten. I was into black holes and all that. There's quite a famous anecdote in my family. I told my grandmother I wanted to be a physicist, and she said, "Oh, brilliant! You can do my feet." Um, <laughs> and then it doesn't, it, it doesn't stop there. I then said, "No, I said physicist," and she said, "Oh, sorry, I thought you said psychiatrist." That was a true, <laughs> true story. <laughs> anyway. Um, very good. But yeah, my family sent me to um, talk to a local philosophy professor. And then I kind of slowly realized I was sort of more interested in the kind of philosophical questions. Um, well, that's a good that's a good lead into to the question I was going to ask Sean, which is, I mean, Sean's written, um, Sean's a physicist, but you've written about consciousness. Um, in your book, The Big Picture, there's a long section devoted to the mind and consciousness. Um, so do you think, do you think consciousness is a subject primarily for scientists or for philosophers? And philosophers have kind of sort of kind of hijacked the subject a bit uh, recently, <laughs> um, laying down kind of um, the nature of the of the of the the debate and insisting that certain things can't be solved by science. Uh, so, who, 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 I mean, who do you think who, is it a subject for for science or philosophy? Really, do you think? Well, I, th I think you certainly need both. L like many things that I'm interested in, um, there's a there's certainly a role for philosophy. You wouldn't want to just have scientists going around there poking with the neurons and, and asking simple if-then questions. You want to think about the bigger picture and how it all holds together. On the other hand, let, let, me, let me be clear, especially in the context of uh, my book, The Big Picture, which, which you mentioned and I did write about consciousness in, I don't really care that much about consciousness, to be perfectly honest. Like, it's interesting in the same way, you know, dinosaurs are interesting or economics is interesting, but I'm not someone who has any uh, special insights to share about how consciousness works or the mind works. I, I'm a, an amateur, a follower of it. What I care a lot about are, is the fundamental nature of reality. That's what I care about. And that's what my book was about. Mm. Uh, and so my interest in consciousness, the, the only reason that I would write about consciousness is because there are people out there, some of them whom you may know, who <laughs> want to modify our best understanding of the fundamental nature of reality because they don't think that otherwise you can understand consciousness. Uh, and, and this baffles me. So I'm, I'm here to push against that. Right. So so, so your attitude is really is that it's, uh, it's an interesting interesting feature of the world and it needs explanation but it's not something that that poses as some philosophers think it does a hard problem something specially resistant to explanation in the way that, that the rest of the world is, is explained. that's right i think that the hard problem will just eventually evaporate as we understand better uh how the mind and brain work right so it's yeah you philosophers can contribute but not uh, not not uh, define the limits of the debate in that way, you think, in the way that's... Well, I mean, let's say, you know, as, as I'm sure will come clear, mm -hmm. um, I'm someone, and I'm pretty close to Keith on this, uh, who thinks that the there is uh, a complete and comprehensive description of the world, which is purely physical, stuff obeying the laws of physics. Uh, yeah. But there are many ways of talking about the world, mm -hmm. including higher level vocabularies of, you know, planets and, and chairs and things like that. And consciousness is part of one of those higher level vocabularies. Mm -hmm. But even if you believe all that stuff, there's still plenty of room to do philosophy. It's not like, you know, there are other philosophers who, who want to sort of have a more central role because they think that mind plays a role in understanding the fundamental nature of stuff in some deep way, which I don't think. But still, how different levels of description relate to each other and how emergence happens and how you can sort of define higher level concepts where you coarse grain, where the information flows, why there is an arrow of time and things like that. All of these are heavily philosophical issues. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, 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 I just say, uh, you know, I really appreciate actually the way you engage with philosophy and, you know, take the time mm -hmm. to sort of see what philosophers think. There are some physicists who are more, oh, this is all a load of nonsense. What are we wasting our time? But actually, I first, Sean and I first got in touch because physics, Barry Lower, who's a philosopher at Rutgers University. And I was saying I'd been reading the big picture and I said, yeah, he's pretty philosophically clued up. And Barry said, I don't know if you want to agree or disagree with this. He said, oh, that's because he talks to me. So, <laughs> but, that um... certainly helps. Talking to Barry is definitely a good way to be more philosophically clued in. In fact, before we went live, I was mentioning humanism about the laws of physics. 
which is the idea that, you know, are, are the laws of physics things that have separate oomph all to themselves, or are they just a nice compact way of summarizing what happens in the world? And I remember very clearly Barry you know, trying to convince me this was an important issue to worry about. And I'm like, I don't care about this issue. <laughs> Stop bugging me about it. And now, of course, I realize, yes, yes, I do need to care about this quite a bit. So he was right again. I think that's one thing that philosophers are quite good at being that being the gadflies and 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 kind of annoying the scientists a bit and saying, look, yeah, I mean, even if you know you've got that right, you know, still you know, be a bit more clear, be a bit clearer about why it's right, and tell me why this isn't right, and you know, just you know, I think we're good at annoying people in that way, and productively annoying. I think is what we should aim to be. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I had a line in my earlier book from Eternity to Here where I say that. Uh, um, physicists are always frustrated by philosophers because they they really focus in on defining the terms and the physicists are like who cares what the terms are you know the specific definition is whereas philosophers are always annoyed by physicists because they're like how can you use all these words without knowing what they mean <laughs> i think there's something to either perspective there right yeah and it, it might make a difference i mean if you think on on some views that they're in the beginning as it were they were just the laws of physics and things kind of popped into existence because of laws of quantum mechanics. How what a law of nature is is gonna is, is gonna really matter there. Um, so, but yeah, okay. So lots to discuss, lots to <laughs> argue about. Um, but just before we get there, we we like to have um, a quick fire philosophy round. So just get get the guest views on the big questions, not getting too bogged down in the debate, but just to see where you're coming from on God, free will. An object and objective morality. Okay, so quick five questions in 30 seconds or less. Does God exist? Nope. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um second, well, do you want to maybe just briefly say you've got interesting things well, to say on this, haven't you? Just uh yeah, no, I thought it was 30 seconds for all five questions. Sorry, I'm just trying to be concise <laughs> oh, here. No, 30, 30 seconds. seconds per question lets me really, you know, uh, expound. Yeah, no, look, God was a perfectly reasonable way to think about the world thousands of years ago. Uh, we needed to understand why things move, et cetera, where things came from. But these days we can do that without in invoking this entirely ill-defined and sadly anthropomorphic version of a, a fundamental entity. <laughs> Cool. Does, do we have free will? I'm a compatibilist, so I'm very happy to talk about human beings as agents making choices, but I don't think that we have the ability to sidestep the laws of physics while doing so. Good. So it's a bit similar to the consciousness view then. It's it's real, but it's it doesn't change our view of fundamental reality. Yeah. And is morality objective? No, certainly not. But it I is mean, it. it's... <laughs> I could very easily just describe the world without using any vocabulary of morality uh, whatsoever. Uh, I mean, look, this is this is a place where my um, views have evolved. When I was a kid, I you know, when I was in college and undergraduate, I used to be exactly that guy who thought that you could derive objective morality from Darwinism or, or something like that, right? Um, but no, you can't because you're always sneaking in some assumption about what is good and bad. And those assumptions are always questionable. And I think if you're honest about it, it's not uh, uh, objective. I'm a, I'm a moral constructivist that way. Mm. I think I went in the other direction, actually. But I, I used to be um, what's called an error theorist that just thinks all, there are no moral truths. And um, during my MA at Reading University, I was sort of converted to a pretty hardcore moral realism. But anyway... Yeah, that might be another a, a, a topic for another day. Brilliant. Okay. Well, I think we've we, we've got an idea of where you where you fit in on the big questions there. Okay. Um, well, let's let's well, let's get into the to, to, to consciousness. Um, I'm sorry. I'm noticing that like it's really I'm very dark because I have this window right behind me. So I'm just going to change my view a little bit here. Sure. Just it'll take ten seconds. Don't worry. Sure. Don't, I'm not no really worries. Angry. So we're going to have a chat at the end, Keith, about the uh, the Phil Papers 2020 survey that's just come out. Survey, yes. The um, results opinion. just out uh, last week, I think, were they? Yeah, yeah. But the survey so, was done in, in uh, last year, I think, wasn't it? It's yeah. So really huge survey on the opinions, the philosophical opinions of Anglophone philosophers throughout the world on 
the questions we've just been asking. Does God exist? Do we have free will? What do you think about consciousness? And um, it's incredible to get some sort of data on what, on what <laughs> philosophers think. Uh, but yeah, we're going to, I think after, after Sean leaves us at the end, we'll, we'll have a quick chat about it. Did you see this, Sean, incidentally, while we brought it up, the, uh, the Phil oh, yeah. slightly? No, yeah. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the uh, of the whole project, and I, I I think I blogged about it when it uh, the first version of it, and this time I have not had quite a chance to actually look at it very carefully, but um, it's fascinating to me. As I, I think I, what I tweeted was that uh, mostly the philosophers are right, <laughs> but, the, but for any particular crazy point of view, you can definitely find some philosophers who are willing to uh, defend it. Mm -hmm. Compatibilism got a healthy majority, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But and actually, naturalism. Um, li libertarian free will was a little bit more popular than no free will. And so sometimes I think people, like, if you listen to sort of Sam Harris or something, you think no one believes in free will anymore. But actually, his position is the least popular, although compatibilism has the, uh, has the majority. Well, I think this is a whole discussion that would be worth having in some other venue, which is like the mismatch between what academics uh, think about as the consensus in their fields when they're talking to each other and what actually filters through to the public. Like in physics, certainly, uh, the set of, of things that physics professors talk to each other about is pretty different than uh, what, what happens in public discussions about physics, you know, on Reddit or, or uh, podcasts or whatever. That is an interesting topic. That's, 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 that's true. The, the, there is, there's, there's the academic version, and then there's the popular version of the academic version, and uh, they're, they're quite distinct things often. And it's it's, it's interesting to think about how they're related. A few, um, a few years ago, I had put something on again my blog about string theory, and mm -hmm. I got an inquiry from New Scientist magazine, and they said, "Wait, people still are interested in string theory?" <laughs> and this is like ten years ago. I'm like, "Yes, it's actually still the dominant thing in uh, theoretical physics departments. It hasn't gone away just because certain people in the public sphere have been bad mouthing it." <laughs> yeah. So the, the popular science journalism, that there's nothing they like more than revolutions than uh, yeah. uh, than the man who had the uh, or the woman who had the uh, the revolutionary insight on her way to work or whatever. Um, okay. Well, we 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 we're mainly you know, the focus here is mainly on consciousness, I guess, because that's what Philip and I uh, work mainly on. Uh, so you've already uh, said a little bit about consciousness, but uh, can we just get into this a little bit more? You, you a, a lot of people, a lot of philosophers anyway, and I think a lot of lay people think that somehow consciousness resists explanation in the, the same way that other features of the world is, uh, uh, can be explained, and that it's somehow not part of the, that it's somehow distinct from other from the rest of the physical world. Not necessarily as a distinct thing, but as some sort of aspect of the world that isn't really captured by the physical uh, the, the physical picture. Something that, that science and physics leaves out. Uh, now, you, you, you've already indicated that you don't think that, but so how do you think it fits in? And why do you think people think it doesn't fit in? Yeah, I mean, I think one of these questions is much easier than the other. I think that um, consciousness is hard to understand. Let's put it this way. The fact that consciousness is hard to understand is the least surprising thing in the world to me. I mean, the human brain is just a, a wildly complex structure, arguably like the most complex structure that we know about in the universe. Um, so a priori, if you just knew about the what these things were that we were discussing and didn't have any pre-existing views about how easy they would be to explain, uh, of course you would expect this to be one of the last things that we really get around to understanding as science progresses. And so the fact that we haven't understood it yet uh, in any you know detailed, quantitative, uh, replicable, et cetera, et cetera, way is just the least surprising thing in the world to me. Whereas I think that the fundamental laws of physics, we can argue about the word fundamental, but you know, as I write in various papers and in the big picture, there is a level of understanding um, called the core theory, which we can get into, where we talk about the quantum fields that make up atoms and molecules and stuff like that. And we understand that really, really well. It's way simpler than consciousness. And so, you know, my attitude is that uh, if there's any apparent incompatibility between our understanding of fundamental physics and our understanding of consciousness, 
uh, we shouldn't be too tempted to change the part we understand really, really well just to accommodate the part we don't understand at all. Right, right. Maybe we could we could talk uh, talk about this because I, I, one thing that you, you make very clear in, in in your book is that we the, we understand the what you call the core theory very well, and now the core theory, in a sense, it describes everything. In a sense, it describes the the fundamental uh, uh, features of the universe, but it doesn't mean that it describes everything in the universe. We need to do other kinds of science to 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 find out. You know, we need to do geology and biology and you know psychology and all these things to find out all the other complex things that are constituted by the stuff that the core theory talks about. So you can't derive that from the core theory. That the core theory imposes constraints on those other theories. There are things that those theories that you, you can rule out. Just by knowing about the core, things like such a, uh, such as telekinesis and that sort of thing, you think we could rule those out from what we know about the physics, even though physics doesn't tell us what the mind can do. It tells us some things the mind can't do. Could you could you set that out for us a bit? Because I think it's really really helpful. Sure. Uh, so the core theory is just the label that was given by Frank Wilczek, a famous physicist, uh, to the combination of the standard model of particle physics, which has been this triumphant thing that we put together in the 60s and 70s, uh, but also gravity. So there's this idea out there which has some truth behind it that we don't understand quantum gravity. But what we really don't understand is quantum gravity in like near a black hole or something like that. We understand quantum gravity fine around the Earth, where you just want to understand why atoms, why uh, apples fall from trees or the moon goes around the Earth, etc. So the point of the core theory is not that it is a theory of everything. It's not that it will never be uh, found to be uh, supervening on some even more fundamental theory or anything like that. It's that in its domain of applicability, it works. And it's right. domain, of, that's number one. And then number two is its domain of applicability is large enough to include all of our everyday lives, like you and me, and even by every, our everyday lives, I mean the sun shining in, you know, in the sky and, and stuff like that. There's no room for major modifications of the laws of physics that would have an effect on biology or psychology or anything else that goes on in our everyday lives. Okay, so that's one Part and if you, I, I talk about that certainly in the big picture. If anyone wants a slightly more uh, rigorous, careful discussion of that, I wrote a paper just this year uh, called "The Quantum Field Theory on Which Everyday Life Supervenes," where I go through all of the arguments in in more detail. Um, then the other part is okay. What is the relationship of that particular theory to higher level theories, like you say, biology, psychology, etc. I think that you, you, Keith, mentioned the word derive, uh, as in we can't derive geology from particle physics. Um, you know, I don't like to use that word, not because it's not true, but because it's not the point. Right. Um, you know, I can't, I can't, there's certain integrals I can't do, <laughs> but that doesn't right. mean they're not doable. It right. doesn't mean that, you know, that we can't figure out what's going on. I think that, well, what if we could derive it? Who cares in some <laughs> sense? Like, we can derive fluid mechanics from right. atomic physics. We actually know a procedure for doing that. But if we didn't, if no one had yet invented that, it would still be true that fluid mechanics supervenes on atomic physics. And that is what I think really matters. What matters to me is not whether we can derive one level of description from another, but that everything that goes on when we talk about geology or biology or psychology um, can be talked about without compromise in the language of particles and fields um, in the in the deeper level. There's no new ingredients that need to be added to understand geology uh, starting from particle physics. Of course we can't derive it. It's just way too complicated. Yeah. Um, but it would be, there's zero evidence that we need to keep introducing new ingredients as we go into more and more coarse-grained higher level theories. And that means that we can... Sorry. Technical word. I want to get a buzzer for when a technical word comes okay. in. The word supervene. Oh, yeah. in there. Could you just say a little bit just for people who aren't familiar with that good, word? Good. Sorry to interrupt, Keith. Yeah, this is, you know, in, early in my career of uh, faking being a philosopher, uh, when I first went to my first ever philosophy conferences, and they would just use the word supervene all the time, and I had no idea <laughs> what it meant. But it's roughly speaking a way of that philosophers have made slightly more precise the idea that something depends on something else, right? You know, 
dependence is is another fraught word, so they don't like to use that. So to say that one concept supervenes on another concept just means that if you ever change the higher level concept, you better also change the lower level concept. So in other words, if I say the temperature in this room supervenes on the, the motion of the molecules of air in this room, what that means is there's there does not exist any other configuration where the temperature is different, but the molecules are doing the same thing, right? That's what supervene means. So it's, it's just a way of saying that there's nothing new that goes in. You can't change the higher level stuff unless you're also changing the lower level stuff in your description. Right, and the same and so, would go for the mind. Get yeah, and, and so what that rules out then, I, if I, I think, is that if if the mind were non-physical and didn't supervene on this stuff, then it couldn't do anything. Is that kind of right? Because that would involve changes that at the at the level of physics that are not uh, explicable in uh, at that level. That's is right. That right? I think that it, we can ru rule out from the from the, from the core theory. Well, I don't. So I don't. I don't like the lever the language of ruling things out either. Uh, you know, I'm a Bayesian. I talk yeah. about credences and our degrees of belief in these things. Look, the core theory might be wrong. That, I'm certainly right. not saying it right. can right. be wrong, right. uh, and it could be wrong at the level of particle physics, much less at the level of uh, you know higher level emergent stuff. What I'm saying is, there's a huge burden on right. anyone who wants to introduce deeply fundamental new metaphysical concepts because the core theory is so overwhelmingly successful and rigorous and highly tested. So it's not a matter of it rules out anything right. about mentality, but that you better really, really have good reason and, and be right. very rigorous yourself if you want to change things. So it should we should be highly confident that all the features of the mind do supervene on, uh, on the features described by the core theory. I would say that, yes, exactly. Uh, which we might loosely call physicalism. Um, yep. And so, and, and that's, I take it, that's that really sums up your attitude to consciousness. It's, it's, it's some higher level feature of the world that we describe using a particular psychological vocabulary, but really it supervenes on this, on, on, on the stuff described by the core theory. And uh, it's, so the idea then that it poses some special problem unlike other aspects of the world is just very very you, we should have very low credence in that we should just find a very low probability to the idea that it's that it's not just a just a, some other part of the of, 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 of the of, of some other high level feature of the universe just like the things described by geology or or, uh, or, or the rest of biology or whatever yeah, no, I think everything no, you said there is exactly right. I'm, I, I, I have no more objections to the vocabulary you use there. In fact, the whole point of my book, The Big Picture, was sort of an apologia for this kind of physicalism. Uh, I, I used more the word naturalism in the book, but it was a specific type of naturalism that was really physicalism, and I, and I do say that. And the point is that we haven't answered all the questions that there are to be asked, even in geology or even in you know sure, climate sure. science. But no one really thinks that climate science requires us to go outside of uh, the core theory and, and invent new right. fundamental metaphysical categories. And so the argument was supposed to be that even though we don't understand consciousness or the origin of life, for that matter, or things like morality and so forth, the way to bet is that when we do, it will be within a framework that is entirely physicalist. Right. Now, okay, so I, th I think this leads into probably what, what Philip's going to ask next, because I I suspect what the line that some people would come back with here is, it's not just that we don't understand consciousness, that it's like, we just know what is it, but there's lots of things we don't understand. It's that we have a certain um, grasp of what consciousness is that positively shows us it can't be that kind of picture, that, that kind of feature, that it can't just be some complex configuration of, of physical uh, uh, structures. Uh, so it's not just that it's, it's, we don't understand it, but that it actually resists explanation in that way. It, it positively resists it. And there are various philosophical arguments of this, which maybe, Philip, would you like to? Well, maybe we could focus on it. So that actually, there are lots of things about what Sean just said, I'm itching to debate, but we'll we'll, we'll save <laughs> we'll save the debating for just to get to spend a little bit longer getting clear on your view. So you know, as Keith says, so there are these many philosophical arguments which try to show that we, in principle, we couldn't give a physicalist, materialist account of consciousness in the way we've given a materialist account of heat 
or lightning or something. Um, um, so, I mean, so there's a, the story of Mary in a black and white room, or I know something you've talked about and thought about as zombies. So maybe, maybe I could just spend a minute giving a basic gist of, of why people think about these zombie things. And then, and then you can, um, give us your perspective on, on how you would address this kind of argument. So it's trying to show, it's not trying to show we just don't have the answers yet. It's trying to show in principle, materialism cannot account for this phenomenon. So zombies, so it's important to distinguish Hollywood zombies from philosophical zombies, um, right? So Hollywood zombies, are, you know, I watched a very good uh, Korean zombie movie on Halloween. I can't remember the name of it now. Um, anyway, that's not the kind of zombies we're talking about. Um, got a bit silly towards the end. Anyway, philosophical <laughs> zombies are, uh, they, they look just like us. They behave just like us. And they do that because the physical workings of their body and their brain are just like the physical workings of our bodies and brains. But there's an important difference. They have no consciousness. There's nothing that it's like to be a philosophical zombie, right? So you stick a knife in it, it'll scream and run away, but it doesn't actually feel pain. Or when it's crossing the road, you know, it looks carefully, uh, crosses the road carefully, but it doesn't actually have any visual or auditory experiences of the environment it's just a complicated mechanism set up to behave just like you or i okay so nobody why are we thinking of, nobody thinks these are real i think there is one person actually who thinks everyone's a zombie but then I, I can't remember anyway most people don't think they're real but the point is they seem to be conceivable in the sense that there's no contradiction or incoherence you can't rule them out just through sitting in your armchair reasoning so they're more like flying pigs and square circles, right? You can know just sat in your armchair, there are no square circles, it's just a contradiction. But flying pigs, you have to go and look at the world. So, okay, so why, so why is that interesting? I think the thought, some people won't get into the whole argument, but the basic idea is if zombies are conceivable, not, not real, if they are conceivable, that seems to show there's a sort of explanatory gap between the physical brain activity and the conscious experiences, a gap that doesn't exist in other cases. So if you take like water, you know, we, we can't really conceive of a physical world exactly like ours with H2O molecules in oceans and lakes and, but where there's no water, that sort of just, just doesn't make sense. Or, you know, a world just like ours with electric discharge comes out of the, clouds in a storm but there's no lightning that is, whereas it does seem totally conceivable coherent a world physically just like ours but where there's no one has any inner experience so so many people say like well david chalmers i guess is most associated with it. this shows that the, the materialist account doesn't really explain what needs to be explained it doesn't it seems to leave a gap that doesn't exist in the case of other scientific explanations what do you think sean carroll so I love the zombie argument because it leads to exactly the opposite conclusion that uh, most people say that it does. And in fact, you know, Philip knows this. Um, when I wrote my little uh, article that was collected in the Journal of Consciousness Studies uh, responding to Philip's book, uh, at first, the, 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 the first draft of my article, that it later became Consciousness and the Laws of Physics. And I talked a lot about the core theory and and uh the causal completion et cetera et cetera of physics um but the first draft was called the zombie argument for physicalism uh and i only sort of revised it considerably because i realized that other people had made this argument already before me and so i wasn't really adding that much kachi balog in particular uh did a very good job of it and so here's what i would say you know imagine that you can conceive of zombies so by, by which we mean exactly as philip said but i just want to emphasize it what we're imagining here is a set of a, a world that behaves in exactly the same way as our world does but just lacks this inner experience of consciousness so there are people in this world they laugh and they cry and they you know proclaim love to each other and they write books about the hard problem of consciousness and they do all of these things and you're saying that I can I, I could conceive of that world, the zombie world, or I could conceive of a world where there's all that behavior and also there is this inner experience of consciousness. Uh, what that 
clearly implies is that if you ask any zombie about their inner experience of consciousness, they will lie to you. Because all these people, all these zombie people say, oh, yes, I have a very strong inner experience of, you know, the redness of red or whatever it is. Uh, and the clear implication of that is that the introspection being done by the zombies is completely unreliable. Uh, and I think that exactly the same thing is therefore true about the introspection being done by the people who are purportedly not zombies. What, you're, what you have very, very clearly from that argument is a conclusion that whatever it is that you're claiming to have as inner experience, it has zero effect on your behavior in the world. And that's clearly not what I want to explain when I talk about consciousness. I think that my experiences have an effect on me <laughs> when I go through the world. And so if you're saying I'm, I have this deep, metaphysically profound uh, way of changing our view on the fundamental nature of reality that helps me explain consciousness, and it has zero effect on how I behave, then I'm just like, okay, I'll, I'll spend my time thinking about other things. <laughs> So what do we learn from this? You think that the zombies are incoherent? Is that is that the, they seem coherent at first, but really? Yeah, because I think that what you would what would you would in conclude in the zombie world is that of course people are conscious. They're you know they're having experiences. You can talk about them. Like, did you experience the redness of red? Yes. Were you sad? Yes. Like you can have all that stuff. And so what those people would call consciousness is an emergent phenomenon from the underlying physical stuff. And I don't think you add anything at all to say that we need something other than that. There's a there's a lovely little paper by Alan Cotterell called Sniffing the Camembert, which describes a partial zombie who is it's just like a zombie, like as Philip described, except that he this, this character has some insight into his own condition. Um, I think it's a he in the example. And so you, um, you ask this partial zombie about their experience and they say, uh, well, let me see. I can tell you that the, uh, uh, the the sunlight is filtering down through the trees there, and it's uh, the it's creating a sort of rippling pattern through the through the leaves, and it's it's a sort of and they're describing in great detail the pattern of light and how it's reflecting and uh, and 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 it's and it's great and it's conjuring up in me these memories and these associations and these feelings and so on. They go in there immense detail about the visual scene in front of them and its effect upon them, but then they add, mind you. I'm not seeing any of this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think and we're supposed very... now. If the zombie notion was coherent, that should be co that should we, we should be able to, that should be a coherent notion. You know that, that they could have access to all the information and all the effects of all the information on them without actually seeing. Now, I don't find that conceivable. Well, exactly. I think that most people who proclaim the conceivability of zombies, they do a little equivocation. They say that, yes, the physical behavior is exactly the same, but they don't really think that. I mean, they don't really think that the zombie would say, you know, no, I'm seeing everything. I'm feeling everything. I, I, I felt very heartbroken when my kitten exactly. died or whatever. Like, they don't really think that. <laughs> they, You know, the zombie is kind of an automaton of some sort that might, you know, roughly speaking, <clears throat> act like a human being, but it wouldn't quite have the emotional um, uh, experiences that it would relate to us in the way that a real thinking being would. And again, if it did, then what that extra stuff is in the non-zombie is certainly not the consciousness that I know and love. Exactly. So I've got I to push back here a little bit. I think we were going to debate. Later, but, but I suppose, I mean, what you both seem to be pressing at is like, oh, this, how far-fetched this is. You know, it's a kind of ludicrous, but... I mean, it's it's not supposed to be real. It's supposed to be... No, a, no, Philip, that is exactly not ludicrous. what I'm pushing yeah. back against. Sorry, i got to push okay. back against you pushing back. I'm no. not saying it's ludicrous. I'm What's... saying that it proves that consciousness is physical. That's what I'm saying. Do I'm saying that if we really had a world where there was no extra stuff that was somehow consciousness based, and yet all these collections of atoms and, and molecules that made up human beings talked like real human beings talked we would call that consciousness because it is the see what's the remove in your argument you seem to move from conceivability of zombies to my consciousness doesn't do anything i don't i don't see what how that inference is justified it, you know just because it, it's coherent logically coherent there could be something that behaved just like me but didn't have consciousness it doesn't follow that my consciousness doesn't do doesn't do anything 
If uh, I asked wait. Zombie Philip Goff what they were experiencing and why they were <laughs> reacting to it, they would give me exactly the same answers and exactly the same behaviors that yeah. real Philip Goff does. And so clearly this about? extra stuff that real Philip Goff has is not affecting their behavior. So why? It seems like you're judging consciousness from the perspective, oh, if it doesn't lead to in behavior, then it's then it's not real or it's not important. Um, Kat it's Gus, not what I think of as consciousness. Got... How in the world can you say there's a thing called consciousness that has no effect on my behavior? And not just on your behavior, but on any of your psychological reactions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Who said it had no effect on your behavior? That... If zombies I, are I, conceivable, I think... it has no effect on your behavior. That's the argument. It doesn't follow... Just because there could be something that behaves just like me but doesn't have consciousness, it doesn't follow that my consciousness doesn't do anything, right? Well, um, there yeah, well is that, a, that's where the, 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 the supervenience thing comes in. There's a physically identical version of you that acts in exactly the same way. <laughs> it, seems, it seems to be implicit in what you're saying that our concept of consciousness is behavioral is based on, on on the behavior it gives rise to so if they behave the same way you said quote we would call that consciousness but i think our our, our concept of consciousness it, it isn't formed in that way our conscious our concept of consciousness isn't formed from observing people's behavior and creating sort of shorthand terms of behavior it's rather based on our immediate awareness Do of our own feelings and experiences our, our pleasure pain. that's what we mean by consciousness and so it's perfectly coherent to suppose it could be something externally just like me, but doesn't have that thing that I'm aware of. Get away with that. Inside. Don't Sorry? let him get away with that label of behavior. No, that's there. just what it's on to say, Philip. Much, I mean... <laughs> much more than external behavior. It's about a direct all, quote, all psychology. Said, we would call it consciousness if right. they behaved in all these ways. But, but the point is that I, I, I'll, I'll repeat. If your notion of consciousness has zero effect on behavior, then I just don't care. Then I don't think you're explaining what I would call consciousness. Right. So I don't think I I don't think it follows that it that it doesn't have any impact on behavior. So I mean I, I mean I think of a physicalist world. Well, maybe we don't want to jump the gun a bit too much, but I think you know as a purely kind of mathematically describable world in which let's say there's no consciousness. That's coherent. But our universe could be very different. It could be that in our universe, the mathematical description we get from physics is un uh, there's something underlying that. There's something that it's the structure of and that that stuff might include consciousness. So it could be in our universe, my consciousness does have an impact on my behavior. So so I, I, th I just think there's an unwarranted inference here from there could be something that behaves just like me that didn't have consciousness to my consciousness doesn't do anything. I just I don't see what's justifying that inference. I, I think it's pretty clear. We have a theory of the stuff of which I am made. That theory makes predictions. That theory predicts whatever it predicts. And so what we're presuming for the course of this argument that it predicts how I really do behave, right? And so you you want to add something to that theory or you want to change the the uh the way in which we think about what that theory is, but your changes or additions are not changing the behavior in any way. It, to me, it's a reductio because you're saying, I, I understand the move, but I'm just not letting you get away with it. The, the move is the following, like all these neuroscientists and physicists, et cetera, they want to look at what happens in the world and the behavior of things. And sure, they have theories of that, and I'm probably not going to be able to really modify those in any convincing ways. But I have access to my inner life, which is different. But my point is that you're reducing that thing you have access to to something so so meaningless that it does not affect our behavior in any way, that there is no connection between my inner experience and what I tell you my inner experience is. And at that point, you just say, all right, it's uh, I've made a mistake. So go on, Keith, do you want to come in? Uh, uh, Philip, Philip, can, Philip can sort of have his cake and eat it here a little bit because he can say that the physical explanation is kind of concealing a phenomenal explanation because these physical states that are that we pick out as doing the the, the causing of behavior and other reactions and so and it's not just about behavior it's about all the psychological reactions huge so behaviorism is a is a is a red herring and a you know it's 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 reactionism um 
And it's all the things that the, the 85 billion neurons in here are doing. They're all part of the story. It's not just behavior, me waving my hands about. It's very important to be clear that they, the zomb, all the 85 billion neurons are doing exactly the same in the zombie. Uh, but Philip can smuggle in phenomen, ph ph the phenomenal here by saying that those physical states are, sort of are fundamentally phenomenal. So when you pick out the physical states doing the causing, it's actually really deep down in some way, sort of like at the level of quantum fields or something, a state of consciousness. So you can smuggle it in, but still, <laughs> you don't get any differential sensitivity. The mechanisms that are, the introspective mechanisms that are sensitive to the presence of that state would, you know, would be triggered and would produce exactly the same response, whatever its fundamental nature, right down at the right down at the fundamental level. So it's not differentially sensitive to them. So no, I think that's, that's, I think that's coming along for the ride. Because... It's not doing. It. This is exactly why the zombie thought experiment is so crucial here, because yes. I would feel differently if the argument was, uh, I need to imagine some fundamentally mind-based or consciousness-based uh, undergirding of the nature of reality in order to account for the behavior of human beings. Mm -hmm. But if you yeah. are a granting that you don't need that, exactly. then you could have a purely physical understanding in which human beings would behave in exactly the same way, then exactly. okay, I'm, I'm moving okay, on. Okay, right, can we, I, I, I propose we take a step back because <laughs> Sean and I have jumped back into an argument we've had a couple of times and some people watching or listening to this might not know what, so Sean kindly contributed to this volume of essays on uh, it responses to my book, Galileo's Error, and, um, I feel I just want to say off I feel a bit guilty that you didn't get to publish your full version which so I it, the, it, the it's word on, it's was, on there it's there on the internet it's somewhere the yeah the word <laughs> count was getting massive and um yeah I told everyone to cut them down and some people uh Sean diligently and kindly did that and other people didn't so Sean got his <laughs> cut down essay but anyway the full version with the zombies is um it is in the preprint but um which we should connect to the video actually Okay, so so let me just try and sum up where we got to last time we had this debate, and then and then, so so your thought is so I as a panpsychist think consciousness exists at the fundamental level of reality, plays a role there. Uh, then Sean, your response, your initial response at least is well, look, we've got this the core theory, this good what we have confidence is, is, a, is a sort of complete theory of mat the matter in our bodies and brains. Uh, and that its predictions are based on physical properties like mass, spin and charge, not on consciousness. And so if consciousness were also playing a fundamental role, then it would have different predictions, right? We'd have a theory of different predictions. So there's a clash with panpsychism and the core theory. My response so, to that. No, yeah, that's no, not what I said. <laughs> I said that there's an option. You, you, there's there's a dilemma there's an that the fans like is faced. And there are two choices. You can have a version that affects the behavior of the particles in the core theory or a version that doesn't. And I see problems with each of them. OK, so I I, I want to take the option that, that, that doesn't want to modify the core theory. So I'll Good. just give my response and then and then we can take it, maybe take it from there. So. So I say that you're thinking of panpsychism as, as a rival to physics, a rival to the core theory, but actually we should see it as an interpretation of the claims of physics. So physics is giving us this totally mathematical description. There are two ways one can respond to that fact. You can follow Max Tegmark and say, and I think yourself, Sean, say, well, yeah, maybe, maybe reality at the base level is purely mathematical. Or... And this is the approach the panpsychist takes is to say, well, maybe there's something that underlies that mathematical structure. There's something that it's the mathematical structure of. So for, on the, for the panpsychist, what we have at the fundamental level are networks of very simple conscious entities that are behaving as they do because of the kind of very simple experiences they have. And in virtue of their interactions, you know, they're kind of predictable. In virtue of their interactions, they realize certain mathematical structures. And they're the mathematical structures identified by physicists such as yourself. So when we when we talk about these simple, what are in fact simple conscious entities, in terms of the mathematical structures they realize, we call them particles, we call them fields, we call their properties mass, spin, and charge. But actually, all there is is are, are these networks of conscious entities 
and physics just gives a mathematical description that kind of abstracts away from that. So, so there isn't a clash between the core theory. There is just, there's the core theory is a scientific option and two philosophical interpretations, at least. Max Tegmark's pure mathematical interpretation or the panpsychist interpretation. That's a philosophical choice, not a scientific choice. Okay, so where do you take it from there? So a couple things. First, you know, this idea that the world is purely mathematical. Um, Max does have that idea. Max Tegmark is a good friend of mine, former podcast guest on my own podcast, Mindscape. I don't realize, I don't, I'm shocked that we've gone 50 minutes before I mentioned that I have my own podcast, but uh, everyone should listen to that too. Um, but it's not some popular view among physicists or, or anyone else that the world is entirely mathematical. The world is physical. Math is a way of talking about the world, representing it. To say that the physical world is mathematical is like saying that uh, a song is its sheet music. They're different things. You can represent it and you can sort of mimic the formal structure of it, but the world is the world. The physical world is, is, is a different kind of thing than the patterns that we find within it. So I don't, I don't, I start off by disbelieving in the dichotomy that you raised. Um, but the second and more important thing is this, this um, uh, distinction that you, you bring up where you say that all of the dynamics of the core theory with the protons and neutrons, et cetera, might be correct, but underlying it is a fundamental uh, aspect of consciousness somehow. And that's, again, you know, now I think I'm just repeating myself and I, I worry about this, but that's where the zombie argument comes in. If, if you had said that, if you had said that I cannot conceive of the physical world as I know it without imagining some underlying consciousness uh, it, that, that sort of allows it to exist, then we would have an interesting conversation. And I think that would, I would not believe you, but at least that would make sense to me. But if you say, no, I can also imagine a purely physical world not based on consciousness in which all the behavior is exactly the same in which I would write the same sonnets and the same philosophy books promoting panpsychism, et cetera, you know, then I say, well, then this, this weird consciousness-based thing is not doing anything. It's playing literally no explanatory role. So why should I pay attention to it? It is doing something. On, on the panpsychist view, all there is is consciousness, uh, simple conscious things at the level of fundamental physics. That That is doing, if so, if anything's doing stuff, that is... Um, just because there is a an, another possible universe that is purely mathematical, let's say, um, purely physical, let's say, purely physical. Let's okay. Let's say I don't want to say that because I want to say the panpsychist universe is purely physical as well. That who let's say whose nature can be captured purely in physics. Um, Galen Strawson says physicalism. I don't know. Let's, don't worry about it. Um, it doesn't show that consciousness. I just think you keep making this false inference that that shows that consciousness in our universe doesn't do anything. Could, could, I, come, could I come in quickly? Uh, look, it. Okay, so you've got something for consciousness to do to sort of provide the the, the, the fundamental stuff of which everything's everything's made, Philip. On your on your view, but how does on earth does that connect up to the consciousness we talk about? Because Supposing that the intrinsic nature of, of, of the physical world is, as you say, this, this, this consciousness, how are we aware of that? I, and I, can, have I got some, does my brain have some detector for the intrinsic nature of matter, which puts me in touch with its, well, I suppose, with its own intrinsic nature? I don't think so, because I don't, I, I don't think this, you know, you can't build a detector for the intrinsic nature of matter. It's something that escapes physicists and escapes third, third person science altogether. So what is it? on your view, that's aware of the intrinsic nature of matter. It can't be me as a biological organism, because as a biological organism, I can't have any mechanism that detects it. So what is it, a soul or something? I mean, what, one issue here is the, is the issue of the relationship between thought and consciousness that, that gets in the way here. That, I mean, your recent paper on panpsychism, you, you assume that what you call the psychological the um, you know cognition and thought, and maybe Sean's thinking this as well. It, we can give a purely physicalist account of that in terms of information processing or something, but so consciousness is just pleasure and pain. And and to be fair, David Chalmers' classic book, The Conscious Mind, did seem to set up that dichotomy. But I mean, I would say I'm one of the in the camp philosophers who thinks that's wrong. That, that cognition and thought itself 
is a kind of conscious experience. Well, let's concede uh, that. Let's concede Let's yeah. concede so, that. Let's but so, let's do my question is how, are we aware of our own consciousness? Yeah. And if so, yeah, well, how? By what mechanism? Well, my awareness is a kind of conscious experience. So you're trying to separate out the awareness you, from the consciousness. I, I don't understand how I can be aware of a property without having some sort of mechanism that's differentially sensitive to its presence. Well, it impact I mean it, it has a causal impact. As I say, it doesn't. I think Sean's Sean's claim that this that, that this that the zombie possibility the possibility of a zombie universe entails that my my consciousness doesn't do anything i just reject that assumption so my consciousness yeah, does the, do something the nature of the conscious experience doesn't do anything the physical state you know we, we can describe it now what it's in, in, intrinsic nature is who knows presumably only it knows now you know maybe the atom right. has a sort of intrinsic you yeah absolutely from the outside yeah. but yeah. that's all there is consciousness so of course it's doing there's, something there isn't sorry. an inside no, no, to the I intrinsic nature of my like there, there is a little misunderstanding going on here because, uh, you know, Philip, you're saying that in the panpsychist view, of course, consciousness does something because it literally like is the thing out of which everything else is made. Right. But you're I think that that's neglecting Keith's word differential, which is crucially important here, which is how would the behavior of the world be different? in these two scenarios. So sure, we'll let you say, I can imagine a world which is fundamentally mental, fundamentally consciousness-based. And in that world, it behaves exactly in the same way as the purely physicalist world that just obeys the core theory. And so in that world, you would say consciousness plays an explanatory role. But what we're saying is, there's no way of differentiating these two worlds. And so let me let me put it in very clear Bayesian terms for those of you who are good Bayesian reasoners out there, right? We have two propositions. We have physicalist world, panpsychist world. We would like to update our credences, whatever they are, in which world we live in, okay? And we have a little piece of evidence that comes along. And that piece of evidence is your book, Galileo's Error. Ah, how should the existence of this book help us update our credences with all the arguments in it and so forth. Well, the probability of that book coming into existence in either world is exactly the same. The likelihood function is equal. There's no difference between them. And therefore, by ordinary Bayesian reasoning, there should be zero evidence on the basis of that book to think that panpsychism is right because it would also exist in the other world with equal likelihood. Okay, I think you've just made three different points, right? <laughs> so the first point is, you know, um, okay, the, the zombie universe, everything happens the same. So what? It, wh how can there be a difference here? Um, actually, there's a paper by Robert Howell tries to pre press this kind of, in, in Philosophical Quarterly, tries to press this kind of argument. And then there's, anyway. Um, but I think what we could say is, well, the way to see this is that it, the behavior is multiply realized. And that's a familiar concept. If you think like a, a computation can be multiply realized by different kinds of hardware, I think that's what we should think of. Uh, that's what's going on here. That, that my behavior can be multiply realized in this universe. It's realized by my conscious experience, but there could be other zombie universes where it's realized by a different kind of non-conscious stuff. Um, so, so, so that's not that's that's not a problem. But then you seem to say, well, look, there's there's no difference if there's no behavioral difference. And I think that's, I mean, you're th that's that seems to me again a non sequitur. Just because there's no behavioral difference why should that show there's no difference between these two universes there is a difference i mean because look i what the problem with consciousness is it's it's not itself a publicly observable phenomenon you can't look inside somebody's head and see their feelings and experiences so the absence of consciousness may not be at least directly publicly observable but that doesn't mean there's not a difference between these two universes the fact that there's no conscious no inner experience is itself a significant difference. And then your final point is, okay, the, the, well, what's the evidence that Galileo's error, if it was written by someone with consciousness or not, it would be the same. Um, again, I mean, I think you're, so what's that supposed to show? What the, the, the evidential support for panpsychism or what's the... Uh, what, there, what there is you know? no evidence for the panpsychist universe. There can't right. be. You can't produce it. <laughs> Good. In a way, I agree with it. Well, it, it well, let me be careful. <laughs> I, I think there's no, there's no, there's no publicly observable evidence because, look, I mean, I think 
consciousness is, is, is not a publicly observable phenomenon. So in most cases, in most scientific cases, we're trying to observe publicly observable phenomena. And what you do to do that is you postulate a mechanism or, at the, or ultimately you postulate laws of physics. That's re a really good paradigm for explaining publicly observable phenomena. But when we're addressing the hard problem of consciousness, that's not what we're doing. We're trying to account for something that's not publicly observable, but we know about through our immediate awareness of our feelings and experiences. Who knows trying, about it? Just let me Who finish knows about it? Just let me finish the sentence. We're trying to account for these invisible qualities that we are, are access from the inside that can't be publicly observed from the outside. Now, that's kind of weird, you know, but you either pretend it doesn't exist, but the, the, there's something we know to be real through our immediate awareness of it. And when we're doing our Bayesian calculations, when we're trying to work out what the world is like, that's a data point as well. We need to work out our theory of reality to accommodate both what we know about on the data of public observation experiment and what we know about through our immediate awareness of feelings and experiences. And um, we need to accommodate both. It's a totally different explanatory project. You're sort of judging a solution to the hard problem of consciousness in the terms of a physicist trying to explain publicly observable data. Sorry. I've, can I just, I've got to just come in before I explode. It, 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 it's, you say not publicly observable. The brain is part of the public world. The, the, if it's not publicly observable, it's not observable by the brain. The brain's just you know, no different from any other part of the, of the world, any other detector we might build. So who is it observable by? What is the subject of consciousness? You mean when we're who? looking at someone's brain? Oh no, I, I'm asking who. It's it's not your brain because your brain can't it detect the brain. Yeah, well, I would say I am my brain. Yeah, I would say I am my brain, and my brain is is aware of its own how conscious nature. How is it aware of its own intrinsic nature? I mean, is it well, aware of its own mass, its own chemical composition, its own radioactive? Activity. Is it? I mean, it's got loads of properties. Your brain. Which of them is it aware of, and how is it aware of this deep, deep, deep intrinsic one? I think it's a feature of consciousness that when you're when you're in a conscious state, um, you're somehow, in some sense, immediately aware of that state. If you're in pain, you're sort of you can't be in pain without being aware of your pain. Also, human beings have the capacity to reflexively uh, attend to their conscious states. Now, all of this is. You can, from the perspective of the, you know, the only things that are cogent, um, are kosher, are sort of naturalistic mechanisms, then this can sound very weird. But from the starting point of, look, there's this reality we, we know about from the inside. Um, I'm just describing it. I'm not saying we have a total explanation, but that would seem to be... Um, I think the, the thing, the, the important point here that is that is brought up by what Philip has just been saying is, uh, I do think it's cheating to make this move to say that conscious experience is entirely internal and and not observable externally, and to say that that makes it different from other kinds of things oh, that scientists yeah. like to describe. Scientists constantly introduce elements into their theories that are themselves unobservable, but they do so because they have an explanatory role in accounting for the things that we do observe externally. Yeah. And I think that this is this is exactly the reductio that gets non-physicalists into trouble. They want to say, well, consciousness is only internal. That's fine. But the huge question then becomes is, does that experience that you have internally have any effect on your behavior at all? And if you really say no, then I don't think you're explaining anything. And if you say yes, then Keith's question about, well, how does it happen? What is it doing? And, you know, is it is it consistent with the laws of physics becomes important. So, yeah, I, I just that is the you, I totally agree. The, the difference about consciousness, it's not the, just that there's an unobservable phenomenon here. Scientists deal with unobservable phenomena all the time. Many worlds in your own case are not the other universe is not directly observable. But as you say, in those cases, we postulate um, things that are unobservable to explain what can be publicly observed. But in the case of consciousness, the unique case of consciousness, at least part of what we want accounting for is this. I'm in pain. I feel my pain. I'm immediately aware of the feeling in a way that can't be accessed from the outside. That doesn't mean it doesn't do anything. 
That's the non sequitur I think you keep making. That doesn't mean it doesn't do anything. But if you were just trying to explain my pain behavior from the outside or cognitive functioning, mechanisms would do it. But we're not just trying to do that. We've got another data point to factor into our Bayesian calculations. This, this, I, I see red and I'm immediately aware of the experience of seeing red. That needs accounting for. And that's just does the, the, does the experience of seeing red. Is that something that you can tell me about? Well, it's famously ineffable, isn't it? You can't communicate. You can't communicate, can you communicate to, a, to a, me the fact that you are seeing and experiencing red. Yeah, of course. But the same thing would be true of zombie Philip. Yeah. They would so be what? lying. I'm not sure lying is quite the right word, but that's, Steak. I mean, I, I would say when I tell you I have a red experience and you trust my testimony and you can't observe my red experience, but you trust my testimony. And I, I, it's a testimony about this invisible phenomenon. And we take that to be rational. The fact that the, the, the zombie thought experiment, yeah, that's weird. Cause like they're saying they're conscious and they're not, but it's a far-fetched thought experiment. It's only supposed to be logically coherent. It's not supposed to be like plausible. Like it, it could be real. I, I understand. But in that world, they would say all the same exact words that you say about their inner experience. Yeah. And, what and I should not trust them at all. They are entirely unreliable about that. So this is, so, I mean, I think you, you may be heading for a kind of a skeptical, well, why should I trust your, your claims? But that's just like, and there's lots of skeptical worries. Like, how do I know I'm not in the matrix? You know, no, how do I, I don't, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm heading for exactly the same thing that I'm always headed for, which is that this thing that you're invoking is playing no differential explanatory role. I could account for all the things in the world in exactly the same way. It's playing no expansion role in terms of explaining publicly observable behavior. That's the well, task of a physicist. You know your job well. But when we're addressing the problem of consciousness, that's not that explanatory task. But that's again, if you're right. if if the thing that you're explaining does not affect my behavior at all, then I'm just not that interested. It does affect your behavior. It no, because I have a perfectly good theory that accounts for that behavior without it. There's a perfectly good theory, scientific theory, that on one philosophical interpretation, uh, consciousness is not playing a role. But on another philosophical interpretation, consciousness is playing a role. Which one would, would, should we go for? Well, I claim that we, we, need, we need to account not just for publicly observable data, but also for the reality of consciousness. My philosophical interpretation of the core theory can accommodate the reality of consciousness. Yours can't. That's why we should believe panpsychism. But you're, 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 you're cooking up this explanandum by a certain way of, you're sort of saying this, and you're sort of gesture, I can know, inwardly at whatever. And, and, you, and then you kind of conceptualize this in a way that it's not anything, it's not just like a bunch of psychological reactions. It's not, um, I, I don't know what it is. You know, it's, it's this, okay, there's this, you've gestured at something. And then you conceptualize it in some way that gives, uh, that, that that it can't be broken down into a whole bunch of complex psychological reactions, sensitivities, reactive dispositions, and so on, as I think it can, which can all be explained this way. It's some pure, ineffable thisness that's just there, and yeah, and it, the only way we can think of it is is as some fundamental property or some some compound of fundamental problems. But yes, if you conceptualize it that way, you're going to have that sort of problem. You're going to be led down that route. If you de-psychologize consciousness, as I say, sep conceptualize as something that has no, no conceptual link with any uh, any kind of reaction. And not just, don't keep saying behavior. It's about reactions. And the, the vast majority of the reactions that are the characteristic of consciousness are, are, are neural, internal um, ones, uh, but they're still publicly observable. It's about they're not going to if you conceptualize in that way, yes, you've got this problem and you're off down your route. But the question is, why conceptualize it in that way in the first place? Why not say that that's a sort of illusion you're under, that there is this, this pure thing that needs to be Now, you can say, well, you know, just bang the table and say, damn it, it's not an illusion, it's real, it's whatever it is. And it, there is something real there. I absolutely agree with you. I'm just denying that you're conceptualizing it correctly. And now all we can do is just bang the table. The problem is that your banging the table gets you into some sort of parallel universe, parallel world of phenomenal properties that underlie the story, the, the wonderfully productive story that physics tells, and which Sean beautifully uh, articulates in his book, The Big Picture, which I encourage everyone to go out and buy and read right now. 
Um, but um, he, beautiful, this wonderful, and you have this shadow world that, that's behind it. So, it's and this, all, this it, and all it's there for is to vindicate this initial conceptual move you made. Question that move and everything becomes much more productive. This is an artifice set up by using the word psychological just to mean functional, uh, mechanistic. Well, I'm following Chalmers there. Sorry? I'm following yeah, Dave Chalmers there. He made the mistake too. Um, he's not perfect either, I'm afraid. Um, but and I'm then a psychological star. I don't like, care. That's whatever. The word doesn't matter. It's functional, you know. Yeah, functional. Th then there's this weird floaty thing. But I think you know, cognition. I believe in cognitive experience. Cognition is involves experience, and you know. All, well, all you're just making the same with, with regard to cognition as to perception. I mean, yeah, but I'm still going to question yeah. the conceptualization of it. But there's a there's a unified whole, which is my brain, which has an intrinsic conscious nature that is a thinking, experiencing, cognitively functioning mechanism. All of which can be um, cashed out in functional terms. Sorry. All of the we want everything we want to say about what about about how about what your brain's doing, what your mind's doing, can all be cashed out in functional terms, in what I call well, psychology. You can abstract away from the intrinsic nature of my brain and talk about... And there's nothing left. Sorry, the other way around. Go on. Uh, and talk about, you know, I think that's what physics does. Physics abstracts away from the concrete nature of reality and just describes it in terms of mathematical causal structure, what, what Bertrand Russell called the causal skeleton of the world. And then you and Sean tell me, oh, well, if you, you know... If if there's anything filling out of that, it's 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 nothing. It's it's yeah, you know, just do anything. I must let you come back in. You, you're you creating a dichotomy off, between absolutely. fundamentally mathematical or fundamentally phenomenal. It doesn't. There's, there's other options. Anyway, let Sean come back in here because he's, he's the guest. <laughs> I'm done. I, I, I've said everything I need to say. Unless you have more yeah. questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, we've we 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 we, we got got a. I think that was useful to lay out some of these disagreements for the audience. Maybe the more interesting thing to, to do is to be a little bit more clear about what the alternative would involve, since I think that uh, attributing fundamentally, fundamentally conscious essence to the world doesn't help us explain anything, um, then how do we account for consciousness? And so I, yeah. I, it's not that sophisticated. I'm not, like I said, an expert on all these things, but I think that the strategy for any physicalist at the, at the end of the day, whether, whether it's about the existence of life or the existence of consciousness and so forth, is to find these higher level patterns. And I think that this is actually like for any of the young people out there, uh, this is the growth area at the intersection of fundamental science and philosophy, because shockingly, I don't think we've done a very good job at, at articulating when an underlying theory admits higher level emergent descriptions. Um, so the example I always use is the Earth going around the sun, right? Uh, in the case of the Earth going around the sun, we can do a pretty good job at predicting where it's going to be just based on a very tiny amount of data, right? The position and velocity of the center of mass of the Earth. Even though the Earth has something like 10 to the power of 50th particles in it, we don't need to know the positions and velocity of all, of all those particles. And this is an underappreciatedly amazing fact. If we had just randomly selected some subset of all the information contained in those 10 to the 50th particles, we would be able to predict nothing. Like, yeah. let me say I, I give you the momentum of all the particles. So that's a huge amount of information, but I didn't give you the position of any of them. So I gave you half of the information, okay? You can predict nothing because I don't tell you the position of anything. But if you cleverly choose the right tiny subset of information, there are patterns that exist there that are implicit in the underlying deep description, but you don't need to know the deep description. You don't need to know that the earth is made of atoms in order to predict its motion. And Dan Dennett talks about this in, in his concept of real patterns. And so all this is a lengthy prolegomena to just saying, given the underlying uh, core theory or whatever you want, there will be multiple higher, or there can be, there seem to be in, in, point of fact, multiple higher level coarse grain descriptions, um, which capture something interesting, even if incomplete and, and more um, approximate than the underlying theory does. And so how do those fit together? 
right. what kinds of uh, descriptions do you have? A physicalist like myself would say, look, if if you didn't know about consciousness and you were uh, some aliens came down who didn't know about consciousness, let's say, and were observing human beings, they would invent a theory of human beings, right? They would try to describe what these human beings are and they would invent some kind of psychology and they would say, oh yes, this human being is sad. This human being is seeing the color red, et cetera. They would invent what you and I call consciousness purely on the basis of these external observations. And then certain philosophers would say, ah, that they're missing the first person experience. But to a physicalist, you know, they're constructing exactly the same kind of description at the higher level. And so that's what I think will eventually happen for consciousness, even though I don't know any of the details along the way. I think that we will show how, given features of the world based on the core theory and biology, et cetera, et cetera, the best description that we have of these physical systems we call human beings includes all or most of the usual qualities that we associate with consciousness. That's, that's, that, that's really helpful. And I think one thing I think I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask you about here is there's, um, a, a word, you, a term you use, um, um, emergent, Emer you talk about emergent features. Now, um, I, you know very well that there are different the notions of emergence. It's tough. I, I was told by emergent. many people not to use that word in the book. I, I do too, I because we had to do it. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a word that is used in one sense. It's used for something perfectly innocuous and absolutely yep. ubiquitous, and that it's used in another <laughs> sense for something that I think just never occurs, right. uh, the strong emergence. And so it's a dangerous term um, that you do use it. And I actually, I, 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 I do... I, I don't, I'm worried about it because it suggests one thing like emerging from another, like two things, like a whale emerging from the water or something, as if there's two things. And that's not what you mean by it, is it? It's it's a no. sort of something that appears no like a pattern. That's right. Is, is it, uh, and I totally get it. Um, and yeah, the word emergent, I, I think we're stuck with it. I don't know if I, I did try to come up with a better word in this particular yeah. case. It roughly not corresponds easy. to what people think of as weak emergence. Mm -hmm. And I know that not only in philosophy, but in like sociology and other fields, they use it to mean something completely different, like almost yeah. the opposite of, of what I mean by it. <laughs> and the one point I would make is that this, and so for those of you who are in the audience who, are, who don't know, uh, what we're calling the weak emergent uh, well, what we're calling weak emergence, it's number one, not a process over time. It's not like, you know, laying an egg or something like that. Uh, it is a relationship between different theories, a relationship between a, what we might think of as a fine grained theory where you know all the details and a coarse grained theory where you know just some subset of the information like the earth going around the sun. That's a coarse grained description of the earth. You just know its position and its center, center of mass position and velocity. So Weak emergence is just that, the existence of higher level patterns that allow you to make sensible statements about what is going on on the basis of wildly incomplete information, right? Some higher level pattern. And uh, the classic example is actually just fluid dynamics or uh, thermodynamics emerging from atomic theory and atoms and molecules bumping into each other. Strong emergence is almost the opposite. It is, it is claiming that when you have these collective behaviors, there is something that is truly new that cannot be understood uh, if you only knew the fundamental underlying laws. So the way that Mark Badao famously uh, conceptualized it is um, in weak emergence, in principle, you could put the microscopic theory on a computer and simulate it, even if you didn't derive, as we discussed before, even if you couldn't derive the higher level laws, you would still find the behavior by putting the microscopic laws on a computer and just simulating what happens to them. Whereas in strong emergence, you wouldn't. If you think that there are microscopic laws, you would put them on the computer, but when you get got collective behavior, you would get the wrong answer in some fundamental way. So something really, really new is coming in. And physicists, roughly, when they say the word emergence, they always mean weak emergence. And some other fields, when they say they use the word emergence, they always mean strong emergence, which does make it difficult sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So weak emergence is really just something, maybe, could it, would it be helpful to think of it as a sort of pattern emerging in, in, in sort of stuff that originally seems sort of an undifferentiated as it becomes more complex? So you see a sort of pattern emerging and you talk about the patterns of the planets revolving mm -hmm. you know the, which can be described in terms of their center of mass it's not something there's not something extra uh, uh coming into existence 
it's more like your your well there's the pattern coming into existence but that's not something other than a certain arrangement of the things that were already there it's, it's no that's right so yeah that's yeah. exactly right there's nothing extra but there's the existence of this pattern that you may or may not know like i like to say that laplace's demon Laplace's demon purportedly would know the position and velocity of every particle in the universe, right? Like Laplace's demon wouldn't know about center of mass, wouldn't know about temperature, wouldn't necessarily right, know right. about all these higher level things because it knows all the details at the at the microscopic level. Yeah. But there exist these higher level patterns that are that are very useful to us, and th their existence is non trivial, which is why I want to you know say that it's it's. The weak emergence is sort of much less metaphysically profound than strong emergence, uh, but it's by no means trivial or easy. Like, that's what I mean by understanding when it happens. When is there weak emergence? What are the categories that form uh, important, that play important roles in the higher level theories? Like, when I talk about fluids, when I talk about the air in this room, the ontology of that, you know, the fundamental language that we use to describe the air in this room temperature, pressure, velocity, things like that, humidity. None of these words exist at the level of the microscopic theory, okay? It's a completely different ontology, but we can actually yeah, derive yeah. one from the other. And so that's that's doing that in general is a hugely important open problem. I think I think that Dan, Daniel Dennett's talk, uh, one way he talks about this is, is in terms of stances, you can take a sort of, you can, it's a way of looking at a system, picking out certain patterns, certain features of the system that are salient and that you can do things with. And it does seem when you adopt a certain stance that you all, it's almost as if there's new things there because you're suddenly latching on to features that are really salient and that afford you certain kinds of, of, of uh, predictive ability. And it's almost as if they are coming into existence and they, they are for you, as it were, you're latching onto them. And you adopted, as you say, a different vocabulary, a different ontology. So it's easy to see why people think that there is something, there is some sort of fundamental change in in, in reality right. there to correspond to that. But uh, it, just, it just brings us back to what we were saying earlier. You, you think that, at least for the domain in which you know we live, the, the, uh, the, the core theory uh, the, the credence we place in the core theory means that we can pretty much rule out any kind of strong emergence in the. That's right, and and here I need to be like super duper careful because again we use these words and we kind of throw them around and it's a little bit tricky. So um, strong emergence would be the idea. The way I think about it, if I'm trying to be my, uh, you know, if I try to steal man strong emergence, um, I do think that there's a sense in which it can be a useful concept. Strong emergence would happen when you have a microscopic theory that has some constituents, right? That it has some entities that play fundamental roles in that theory. And there's a set of rules that works for describing what happens to those constituents in circumstances where there's just a few of them, right? Where there's just a small number of pieces doing their thing. So an atom bumping into another atom, okay? But the strong emergence would be the case where in the case where you get a many, many uh, constituents interacting with each other, then they behave differently. Then it's literally true that the, that the rules that you thought were sufficient to describe few body reactions fail in some way, okay? And so I would say two things. Number one, if your example of the microscopic theory is the core theory, right, is really particle physics or quantum field theory or whatever, then the strong emergence can't happen because of features of the core theory, because of the simplicity of the underlying ontology, the locality of the interactions, et cetera, et cetera. There's not going to be any strong emergence. The microscopic laws are either sufficient to describe what happens even when you get many, many pieces interacting, or they're wrong. Those are the two options, and they're both options. We can explore them. But if you're, if you're thinking about um, cases where, well, what about, you know, society? What about a, a country <laughs> or, you know, an ethnic group thought of as an emergent phenomenon from human beings, right? right. Where your microscopic theory is human beings. Or for that matter, a human being being the higher level thing and cells in your body being the right. lower level thing. When you're quote unquote, fine grained microscopic systems are more complex themselves 
than electrons and, and photons and so forth, then I can imagine circumstances in which strong emergence happens because those features of simplicity and locality that rule it out in the case of the core theory just don't apply. So uh, as a concept, strong emergence might be very useful in different contexts, just not in the context of particle physics. So is the suggestion then that there might be something like strong emergence relative to of one higher level relative to another higher level, though that would not be counter strong emergence relative to, to, to the basic physical level. That's right. And only because of the specific features that we think exist in the basic physical level as we understand it. So, I mean, I could imagine a completely yeah, different sure. set of laws of physics or a strong yeah. emergence all the way down. Not that hard to imagine if you really thought that there wasn't locality. Like if the, if the behavior of one little, if, if the behavior of an electron depended not only on what was happening in its neighborhood, but in its, you know, several centimeters around it, then you could get strong emergence. But it, according to the laws of physics as we know them, that's not true. The that's one of actual the great things of motion for the electron only depends on what happens at that point. Yeah. And you explain, that's one of the really nice things that, uh, in your book that you explain so clearly how that is, how we know that. Uh, and because it's an effective theory for the dom right. domain in which we live, that we can draw the controls. I think Philip wants to come in. So. Yeah, no, it's all very interesting. And I do, you know, appreciate these helpful thoughts on how to think about emergence. I enjoyed your chat on Mind Chat with Anil Seth, trying to clarify different notions of emergence. But so I, I do, there's another point I disagree with you. So, so Sean had this article responding to my book, and then I had a, a reply to all the essays. And, um, we should link them to uh, on the video. Actually, we yeah. should link. I've got a blog post linking to all the papers. Um, but I disagree both whether this raises problems with panpsychism, as we've been discussing. But I, I, I think I also. So I don't think a panpsychist needs to be a strong emergentist. But I think I also disagree that the success of the core theory gives us grounds for rejecting strong emergence. Oh, actually, just in our first guest on Mind Chat, people might be interested. Tim O'Connor. Is a, is a strong emergentist dualist, um, if people might be interested in looking back at that. But anyway, so why can't a strong emergentist like Tim O'Connor say, well, look, and I think he did say roughly something like this when we interviewed him, you know, the core theory, let's say, is a complete and adequate theory on its own terms, namely as a theory of the causal capacities of particles, fields, the things physics studies, right? It's a it's a further assumption that goes beyond the physics to say that that's all that's running the show, that that's all that determines the cause of the evolution of the universe. So the strong emergence just says these irreducible higher level phenomena, maybe consciousness, maybe free will or something, when it pops up, they co-determine um, how the universe evolves or how that bit of the universe that is my brain maybe evolves in conjunction with the um, the causal capacities of particles or, and or fields. Um, so there's gonna need to be work there. Ultimately, this will need to be theory with testable predictions that, you know, what are the causal capacities of these emergent phenomena and how do they interact with the causal capacities of particles and fields to determine what's gonna happen. But I, I don't I don't think I, I, I would agree with your characterization that that would be to say that, that, that the core theory is wrong. I think we just say the core theory is totally correct on its own terms. No, I think I think uh, there I can just say that I think that's completely false I, it, it, to be very blunt about it, because the core theory has an equation that says what's going to happen. Full stop. You give yeah, me some the, collection of particles and fields, it will say what happens next. There is no room for saying something else comes in and plays a role. Either the equation correctly predicts what will happen or it doesn't correctly predict what will happen. So, it's like saying I have a function, y equals x squared. And someone says, okay, that's fine. Y equals X squared everywhere. Yes, Y equals X squared is absolutely true. But there's another factor that's going to change the value of Y later on. No, like either y equals x squared or it doesn't. Those are those are your two choices. <laughs> so what I think what Tim O'Connor would say, again, this is not my view, but I'm I'm not totally persuaded that you, your view on this. I think what Tim O'Connor would say, one way to think about it is we think of the laws of physics as ceteris paribus rules. They tell us what will happen unless there are other factors in the mix here. 
So that's not to say, so then if you think about them in that way, well then the on the strong emergency, they're not, they're not false. We they, they're set as paribus laws. So they are, you know, and, and so the idea would be that's one philosophical interpretation of them. You're giving a philosophical interpretation to physics such that these are ex, ex, you know exemptionless. Another philosophical interpretation of the core theory is these are ceteris paribus laws. Again, I, I just don't think that makes sense. The theory makes a prediction. Well, You're going to agree with the prediction or not. Those are the only two choices. <laughs> but, the, but the claim would be the prediction is this is what will happen in the absence of... No, that's not the prediction. The effect. prediction is you give me these electrons and photons, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. That's the prediction. I'm yeah well I mean why, I guess, why, I guess what, what is the resistance to just saying you want to change the theory just be honest don't try to hide it if you want to change the theory that's fine if well, you again, don't just to be clear, this, 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 this isn't my view this isn't but I mean may, maybe maybe we're getting to semantics here I don't know about I, I just it seems to me that, that, that there is a choice in how we think about the laws of physics a philosophical choice here and, uh, you know, I guess most working physicists are going to just not be thinking of them as setter as paribus laws. But it seems to me, as a philosopher, trying to understand the laws of physics and how they fit into our overall theory of reality, it's a coherent option to think of them as setter as paribus laws. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just not clear what the argument is on why that isn't a way, a possible way of thinking about the laws of physics. You but can anyway, think about them whatever way you like. But there is <laughs> what the theory itself actually says, and by thinking them in this new way, you're saying the theory is wrong. Just admit it. <laughs> I'll leave it there. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't. Do, do, do physicists think of the fundamental laws as having set set with paribus clauses that this is what will happen no. unless something intervenes. <laughs> no, 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 of course. I'm not saying no, they do. No, you would say that they, you have you discovered a new thing, if that were true. Yeah. You would say you've modified the what, theory, of course. Yeah, what, what's going to intervene? I mean, yeah. you know, God? I mean, That's new I stuff. <laughs> That's what we're looking um, for. That's what we do as physicists. We always are looking for ways in which our theory is wrong in some way, mm -hmm. but we don't mm -hmm. discover a new particle and say, well, the particle isn't there except in these exceptions. We just say, oh, no, it's a new particle. Good. Great. You win the Nobel Prize. Yeah. 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 I, I, and I think the, the, the thing that, that Philip is pressing on there about how, how, how um, we know that the, that what, our, no, okay. our grounds for thinking, uh, for having very high confidence that there, that, that um, there isn't something like strong emergence given the nature of the core theory, I think that was set out very, very clearly by, by Sean in his book. And it's not something that he just does in a couple of lines. There are chap just several, <laughs> there's a whole section devoted to explaining this in great detail. And um, uh, yeah, well, I found myself well, I think, yeah, I mean, just just to say, it is non-trivial. It's not just like, <laughs> uh, well, this was a bad idea. Let's throw it away. As I said, we can imagine circumstances in which there are inter-theoretic relations that one would sensibly characterize as strongly emergent. But there are mm -hmm. special features of the core theory of particle physics that don't allow that to happen. So mm -hmm. I'm perfectly willing to entertain claims that we should modify the mm -hmm. core theory. That's fine. Just admit mm -hmm. it. Just tell us what the modification is. I have one but more go can at this. One more, is... go. one more okay. go at this, and you can have the last word on the show. Suppose I'm a physicist who is sympathetic to Tim O'Connor, and I say, my view of the laws, my philosophical view of the laws of physics is that they are ceteris paribus laws that tell you what happens in the absence of um emergent phenomena like and uh, could i would that make a difference to how i work as a practicing physicist um i mean you would be saying that electrons behave differently when they're in one context than another that's called changing the theory i mean i suppose the only time it would make a difference is if you are investigating um high level dynamics in the brain or something. But insofar as you're okay. working with particle colliders or something, it's not, I mean, this is my colleague, Nancy Cartwright, a very famous philosopher of science. I mean, this is kind of the point she makes and she's not a panpsychist or an anti-physicalist. She just thinks, you know, that what physicists investigate are particles under very 
specific conditions of isolation, not in the messy world. And the conclusions we draw there are to be understood relative to that particular context. Um, and I suppose I suppose it's the kind of the, a different way of making the same point. But anyway, no, so I mean, of course, this this is exactly my point, I, and I make it much more clearly in the um, uh, article I mentioned on the quantum field theory on which the everyday world supervenes that you are absolutely welcome to imagine that electrons behave differently in human brains than at the Large Hadron Collider. You're welcome to imagine that. We would call that changing the theory because the theory makes a very specific prediction about how electrons behave in the human brain. And it's because of very specific properties of the theory having to do with the fact that electrons are featureless and their interactions are local and all these other things. They could have been different and they might be different and by all means change the theory. Tell us how it's different, but you'd be violating everything that we think is true about effective field theories. I think I think that's a very important point. I think Philip, you're neglecting the fact that the theory predicts how electrons will behave in organizations like the human brain. It it takes uh, uh, Sean discusses this in his book. He discusses the kind of physical environment that the human brain is, and from the point of view of physics, it's there's nothing in there that's going to make any difference to the way that the, the, the particles uh, behave. It's not that the, the the theory just it isn't just a theory of how things behave in in in, in particle accelerators. It's a theory of how they behave to core, and I it will also understand. predict how they will behave in accepting very extreme things like black holes or whatever. It will predict. Uh, uh, this is what this is why uh, Sean says it's an effective theory of the sort of domain where we live. It will predict what they will do in all of these circumstances. It's not, a, it's not relative to particle. The particle accelerator is a part of the evidence from which the theory is built. They're not the domain that the theory is trying to explain. Right. I mean, suppose so maybe we could have two strong emergentists. I keep saying I'm going to stop and then I don't. Two strong emergentists, right? One of them says, um, I think the core theory is wrong because electrons behave differently in brains. The other says, no, I think the core theory is totally correct as a ceteris paribus laws concerning the causal capacities, uh, you did, concerning the causal capacities of fields and particles, but that's not the only thing running the show. They seem to me equally possible ways of describing their view, um, but one of them has the bad branding that, oh, the core theory is wrong. Um, and it just seems to me that branding is not philosophically required. I guess I see, the, so now I understand that you, <laughs> now mm. I understand that you're just trying to avoid the correct branding for the idea. The core theory makes predictions. Those th those predictions are right or wrong. You are going to be more interesting if you actually are honest about the ways in which you want to modify the theory. Just say you want to modify the theory. That's really interesting if you could make that work. It's not my, to repeat again, I'm not defending my view, I'm defending someone else's view. But um, yeah, I suppose, I suppose we are talking semantics here. This is a kind of, um, a kind of branding issue. I just, it's, it's just not totally clear to me. I, I just, I think the reason we think your branding theory is, the, is obviously the correct branding is because, you know, most physicists aren't thinking about do electrons behave differently in, in brains. Um, but the, I think what we should... The we real are thinking is, about that. Though. That's exactly what yeah. they are thinking about. They're thinking about how electrons behave oh, really? in all conditions um, within... They uh, might assume... Accepting. They might well, assume thinking. that they do, like... But but it's not part of what they're actually... Look, I mean, what we, should, what we should be doing is... what I mean, the question is, what would settle this is observing brains, right? And, um, you know, do 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 things... Do the call are the causal dynamics of the brain reducible to underlying chemistry? And I think we just don't know enough about the workings of the brain to decide that one way or the other. So that, I mean, that's the real question. So just I suppose putting the branding issue on one side, just kind of saying, "Oh, look at the core theory." I just think that doesn't settle anything. The question is, you know, what was? I think it's an open empirical question. We'll find out more about the brain, and it will settle it. Ultimately, it's an empirical question, but I just so don't think. I this is just bizarre to me that someone would say I'm in favor of a theory in which electrons behave differently in brains than in particle accelerators and mm. not want to cast that as a new different theory because it obviously is. Uh, 
Number two, the the we can be very, very specific. There's a real physics argument here. It's not just hand wavy or a philosophical assumption. We can be very specific about the domain under which we would expect the equations of the core theory to apply. And the human brain is absolutely deep within that regime. It's not even close to being you know, near the boundary of where we would expect it to apply. And number three, if you could actually make a prediction for how electrons would behave differently in the brain, and it could be tested and found right, you would win so many Nobel Prizes, they would retire the award. Why in the world would you avoid doing that? Go for it. So, I mean, I, I appreciate your point. From the perspective of physics, we wouldn't, and you said this in your paper, and I think I responded to it, from the perspective of physics, we wouldn't expect electrons to behave differently in, in, in uh, certain living systems. But, I mean, and, and the point is, from what physics is interested in is the causal capacities of particles and fields. So you you, you say, um, you know, why would you why would you not see that as a as a change in physics? The strong emergentist view. Well, because my imagined strong emergentist says because I think physics, in my philosophical interpretation of physics, it's a theory of the causal capacities of particles and fields. And when electrons do different things in brains. It's not because of the causal capacities of particles. It's because of the emerge, strongly emergent causal capacities of brains. So the core theory is still right because that's a philosophical theory of the causal capacities of particles and fields. And it's bang on. It's just as, yeah. No, nope. so. literally nobody thinks that, Philip. Nobody thinks that. <laughs> Physicists want to know how electrons behave. If electrons behave differently in the brain, they want to know that and they will call that physics. Well, yeah, I mean, I... I suggest there's, I, I mean, I think there's sort of a zeitgeist. Of but there is zero the reason to think it. Okay, that's another question. reason right? to think they behave the same way and we know what equations well, they obey. That's, an, that's, that, that's, that's another question, right? So the, only, gonna... the only reason to think this is because of intuitions that you've got from introspection. Mm. You've sat and sort of thought about your own mind and thought, ah, oh, there's stuff going on here. I'm making decisions that are, well, not me, not you, but they're called the strong emergent, Philip. I'm doing stuff here that isn't that it, you know, I've got free will. I've got this mysterious whatever. I've got this mysterious consciousness that isn't you know just a matter of you know ultimately you know isn't super you know, physics and stuff. And I've got this, so I I, I I I can come up with an alternative physics that on the basis of these intuitions. Now, okay, maybe maybe you can, and maybe you want to try and you know go for it. But don't you see how weak that motivation is? Like now I mean, it, wouldn't it be much better to try and look at what's actually happening psychologically it, when you introspect and where these intuitions are coming from? But look, this is a totally different point. We, it's really, I think it's so important to distinguish, do we have evidence against a view from do we have reason to believe a view? You know, it's like thinking about God's existence. You want to think about the problem of evil as an argument against God and, you know, the traditional arguments or whatever as evidence for, you know, it's you've got to distinguish it. What we've been debating so far is whether there's empirical evidence against strong emergence. And my view is we'd have to whether know it's an brain, Whether it's a like. hypothesis in now, which you should have any prior okay. credence. If we're going to why take it seriously, then it would be something to do on philosophical grounds to do with arguments that, you know, consciousness does not, is not admit of the same kind of explanation we find applied to other scientific phenomena. And, you know, we'd have to have that debate, but so you, my claim would be we can have philosophical motivations for things. I agree that, you know, there's no evidence for strong emergence in the sense look, of publicly observable evidence, but look, there look, might be philosophical. Philosophical is just a fancy word for, 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 for intuitions here. And, um, uh, yeah. Okay. You, you can't. You can't. You, you, there's no evidence against you know the last Thursday is more you know that the universe wasn't created five minutes ago. Or whatever. Yeah, there's no evidence against it. But is it a, a hypothesis that it's worth having any credence in? Well, no. What, I mean, there's no point in it. It's not going to get us anywhere. And it's exactly the same for these ones that are based on 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 sort of on, on armchair intuition. I mean, yeah, okay, you can, you can, maybe you can even, you know, spin them out and make them coherent, especially if you, if you, if you isolate them from any causal effects, you know, which, which of course strong emergentism does, but pan doesn't, but panpsychism does. But they're all just in, in the end. There's no reason for taking them seriously because there's a much, much 
more interesting and fruitful explanation, which involves looking at introspection and how we get these intuitions about our own mind. And that takes us somewhere interesting. Instead of this just stopping with this, well, there's this, and it's a pure you know, fundamental thing, and it's a problem, we've got to do metaphysics. No, there's this wonderfully uh, rich and multifaceted and complex stuff that's going on in our brains, which we have a sort of very uh, obscure uh, access to at a sort of personal level, and which we try to describe in these figurative ways what it's like and so on. Let's try and figure out what's actually going on here. It might give us all sorts of wonderful insights into our own nature. Uh, let's, you know, let's try and <laughs> there's a wonderfully rich program of psychological investigation here we can do in explaining why consciousness seems so mysterious to us. Let's do that instead of just sort of stopping short unimaginatively and saying, well, it's a fundamental feature and that's it. Heather said in the comments, go Keith. Yeah. <laughs> go Keith. Thank you. Uh, okay. I, <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm getting, getting I'm I, I would actually like, I don't know if, if you... Philip wants to uh, uh, go, but I would like to just talk to Sean a little bit about exactly supposing we're both on the same page here. Where, where we go from here and what we say about consciousness, because I think there might be a little difference between us. And I, I'd like to just explore that if that's okay. But if uh, Philip wants to do something else or Sean wants to do something No, well, we were thinking of talking about fine tuning at some point, weren't we, if we've got time. And we'll have questions, audience questions as well at the end. If we're, okay. but if you, but Keith, if you want to talk about I'll that. Just a few yeah. minutes maybe on this. I don't think yeah. there's a big issue. It's probably more terminological, but I describe my position as illusionist because I say that, you might call it eliminativist. I think there's a certain concept of consciousness that we need to get rid of um, that isn't a sort of useful higher level pattern, emergent feature uh, that is just like, you know, the vital spirit or phlogiston or something that's just a, a, a misconceived notion that's not helping anybody. And it, we need to get rid of it from, from science and philosophy. And uh, the interesting question is a psychological question of how we come up with this concept and why it seems so compelling. And now the concept of consciousness that I want to get rid of uh, is basically the one that Phillips has. Um, you know, the one that it seems natural to talk about as something that poses a hard problem that can only be explained as something fundamental and so on, that's kind of, that's got sort of no structure to it, that doesn't have any, that you can't break down into component abilities of any kind that's just this pure feel that's just resistant to any kind of analysis or understanding and that you can't theory can't get any grip on um i, I want to get rid of that because i think it's just doing no good at all and that's one reason another reason i want to get rid of it is that we already have features in our everyday ontology that can do all the work so we can have we have features like colors and sounds and shapes and smells and things understood as features of the world around us so things have colors yeah the, 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 and smells and sounds, and my body has various feelings and you know, pains and so on. They're okay, they're nice emergent features in the weak sense that we can talk about. What we don't need are then mental versions of those things, the qualia, which are somehow produced by the worldly versions in our minds and which we then react to in some internal uh, theater of, you know, the, the Cartesian mm -hmm. theater that, that, that Dennett talks. So, so as soon as you introduce this way of thinking, you have to have two kinds of colors, the worldly ones on the deck. And I think let, let, let's have the worldly ones as dispositional properties of surfaces, dispositions to affect us in certain ways, and just get rid of the mental ones. We don't need them. They're not explaining anything. They're not taking us anywhere. They're like, they're a bad theoretical posit. Now, so in that sense, I'm an, I'm an eliminativist about, or an illusionist about consciousness in that sense, not a poetic naturalist or emergentist. But I'm happy to say that consciousness, there's a difference between being conscious of things and uh, uh, perceiving them non-consciously and so on. There's some difference, and it's really interesting to find out what it is, and I'm happy to be a, uh, a, a poetic naturalist about that. So, Sean, uh, can I persuade you to be an illusionist in my sense, at least? <laughs> well, you no, know, so I don't feel strongly about this. So maybe like on alternate days of the week, I, I might uh, <laughs> go along with you. But I do think it's mostly a semantic distinction, mm. not a, a, a deep philosophical one. In some sense, what I would, my concern would be is that in you're almost granting too much rhetorical ground to the uh, non-physicalists here. <laughs> By by saying that you know consciousness is an illusion, what, what do you mean? I think you c correctly, you know, clearly articulated it. But is this you know specifically mental aspect that is not explicable in terms of physical stuff doing things? Whereas I would be tempted to say, no, consciousness is not an illusion. It's clearly there. 
but it is completely understandable in terms of physical stuff doing things. So uh, I do agree that there is something that should be eliminated or the, something that there is an illusion that that is an illusion. But I, I guess uh, I don't think it's helpful to label that thing consciousness because I think the consciousness is just, no, I, just a higher level immersion thing. I tend to say that I'm what I think is uh, illusively a uh, qualia. Um, these yeah. supposed mental versions of worldly properties. You know, the colors are real. Mental colors right. are not. And I, one reason I, I do like to say that, I think it's use, useful to say this, is because there is a really interesting psychological problem here, that um, which is that why we think there's a hard problem. And it, it, mm. I, it, I can understand where Philip's coming from. You know, I concentrate on the mm. redness of the red, and I think well, that's, that's something kind of primitive and real, and it's, uh, it's just... Oh, it's just there, presented somehow to me, and of course it might not be actually be there in the world. It might be an hallucination or a dream or something or whatever. But it's there, and there's this redness, and it's undeniable, and it's a brute fact. And that I don't trust that intuition. I know, and a zombie might be able to do all the sen sensitivity to the world, the colours, and the reactions, and so on, without having that immediate presence of the redness to it. I can see that intuition. I can, I can feel it, and that to me is a very interesting psychological fact really interesting psychological fact about the nature of introspection, about the nature of the access we have to whatever's happening inside our brains. Really interesting. And the way that our brains are, are, are tracking and reacting to the world and latching on to salient features of the world and the way these features are, 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 are pushing at us and affecting us. And I think that our talk about what it's like is very much about our interaction with the world, about how the world is, 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 is impacting on us. And I think that's really interesting. And that's why I think it's, it's, it's useful to talk about illusion because there's something real and potent and powerful that people like Philip are gesturing at, and they're right that it matters hugely. But their their, their conception of it is misguided. It's and that in that sense, it's an illusion. They're mistaking the complex stage machinery of the brain for the simple levitation effect or something. And that's why I, I stick by the illusion idea because it it, it, it encourages us to, to to ask what's behind it, what's the trickery behind it. Yeah, no, um, I think that, that there are there are important things going on here. And again, I will demure that this is not my expertise, but it is very much in line with the uh, the perspective that I that I mentioned that um, there's a lot to be understood here philosophically. So in that, I, I'm mm -hmm. completely in agreement with you. So let me let me shift the ground to physics things that I understand better because I do think there are analogies there that maybe will clarify, or you can tell me whether they will just muddy mm -hmm. the waters, but you know, um, when we do understand the world better and better in physics terms, sometimes there are ideas that we thought were useful and we realize, no, they're just not there at all, right? Like yeah. phlogiston <laughs> or caloric or whatever, right? The plum pudding model of the atom, the geocentric model of the solar system, they were just wrong, okay? So part one, one way which science can progress is just say, nope, that was wrong, this one is right. But there's another way that science yeah. can progress, which is to say that, oh, this thing that we thought was there is only a useful concept in a much narrower domain of, yeah. of, of uh, physical situations than we thought it was, right? Newtonian absolute space and time is not there in relativity. If we, right. if we frequently hopped into spaceships and zoomed off near the speed of light, that would be a very, very bad idea to keep in the back of our minds. But that doesn't stop us from synchronizing our watches, right? In, in our everyday lives. Or even, you know, Aristotle's idea that in order to keep something moving, you have to keep pushing it. In our everyday lives, that works really, really well. It was not an illusion, even though we later realized there's something called the law of conservation of momentum. So I don't know exactly yeah. where to come down on these psychological um, um, issues, like whether or it's not they will be simply replaced or... Uh, made more nuanced or re realize in what domain they serve a useful purpose. I'm, I'm open to all of those. I think they're important think questions to address. It depends on how it breaks down, to what extent this, what I'm calling an illusion, is due to hardwired features of introspection, to what extent mm. it's due to bad theorizing about the deliverances of introspection. There are all sorts of different possibilities here, multiple factors. You can always hang on to a term by revising, the concept by revising it sufficiently much. Um, and I'm happy to have retained the concept consciousness properly revised. The danger, though, is one reason I, I like to talk about illusion is to shock people a little bit into how much of a revision is going to be necessary. Um, you know, Daniel Danny wrote this wonderful book, Consciousness Explained, wonderful book, which I think did more than 
than uh, any other book in the last 50 years to explain <laughs> consciousness. But people say, oh, you're not, you know, explain consciousness, you explain consciousness away, you're ignoring consciousness. Because, of course, they conceptualize it differently. And so they're not prepared to do the revision. And now I'm trying to say, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna have to recognize that you really are gonna have to revise your concept of consciousness quite a bit here. It's a different perspective. You're gonna have to climb up a different hill and look at the landscape from a different position. So it's not gonna be, because otherwise people will just say, well, you're not explaining consciousness. I'm not explaining consciousness in your sense. I'm saying in that sense, it's illusory. illusory. I'm asking you to reconceptualize what consciousness is. And so I like the kind of confrontational aspect of a bit because <laughs> Uh, you, the, the revision is going to be pretty yeah. substantial, and of course, once you've got people to do that, then we can we can you know we can keep the old terms if we want. But it's like you know reconceptualizing the stars as you know pinpricks in the vault of heaven or whatever, and reconceptualizing them as you know nuclear fireballs that are uh, you know thousands of light years away. It's it's a big one. No, I completely agree, and I, I get it, and I'm I'm glad that I got that little intro to it from you because I knew a little bit about it, but, but um, you're making, you're putting in terms I can very much understand and sympathize with again, to put a, a physics -y analogy into the pot. Um, I just wrote a, my last book was on the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And right. part of that is, you know, there's whole controversies about all these worlds, et cetera, et cetera. But the more to me, the, the deeper thing is the idea that, the way we describe the world at the fundamental level, even below the core theory, right. is as some vector in a giant dimensional vector space. And everything that we think exists, space, planets, particles, electrons, and so forth, is just a convenient way of talking about the dynamics of this vector, okay? Right. And so even things like location and space just aren't fundamental in, in any sense. And I think that even professional physicists and even people who do quantum gravity for a living who are you know supposed to be the most super advanced in thinking about uh the immersion level of space time they still grant space way too much tangibility right. than they honestly should uh they don't they haven't quite internalized yet that it's completely an emergent phenomenon so maybe well, that's I, an I, analogy to how we think about I, I, uh, I, I, nice. something like we, that. we undoubtedly we have brains that, are, that, are, that are, were not designed to do these things oh, no. they were designed yeah. to conceptualize the you know the, the everyday world of you know sort of aristotelian sort of world and and similarly for introspection we, we you know, our brains weren't designed to our introspection i think is probably fairly late and may even you know in its the, the more elaborate forms may be language dependent and uh, you know, our brains weren't designed to conceptualize our, uh, conceptualize their own activity, except they're, well, they're probably think, yeah, designed to do a bit of public relations, and that's all. Yeah, and I mean, this is a great question. And again, I'm, maybe none of us here is an expert on it. Maybe some, either one of you know more than I do about. I mean, part of me wants to resist the idea that introspection is in any sense new because it's just so it's just so basic. And so I always think about my cats. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like they clearly think, right? I mean, they're clearly probably conscious in some sense, depending on what your what your definition is. Uh, and in fact, my two cats have slightly different attitudes towards the future and hypotheticals. Like one cat is clearly thinking through options, and the other cat just immediately reacts to the, the situation around them with no thought for the future whatsoever. So you can sort of see the evolution of these capacities o o over time. But um, do do cats get embarrassed? You know, I don't know. I mean, they they certainly like feel bad. Like a dog can certainly feel bad if it does something. You know that that, that it's uh, that it's. I, I think it's tricky with domestic animals because dogs up. certainly have evolved a lot of behaviors precisely to sort of um, well, yeah, to, and as, as a yeah. sort of user interface with their right. with 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 their with, <laughs> with, the, with the creatures they're parasitic on, and so they've learned that there's all sorts of stuff that really tweaks us in 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 fascinating ways. Uh, like looking guilty. Uh, it doesn't mean that well, and maybe this is something are. that I mean, Keith, you mentioned this before, and I think you know, um, even though I, I think I'm in favor of letting a thousand flowers bloom in all sorts of difficult questions and things like that, but one of the things that that I, you know, sort of disappoints me about the attitude of many philosophers is not not disappoint is not the right word e either, but. I think there's a missed opportunity here because if you just did say, all right, let's be purely physicalist and let's imagine that we're trying to explain the world as this rich interconnected web of emergent descriptions and intertheoretic relations and, and things like that, 
there's so many things to be done, so many important questions to be addressed. And it's just like so rich. And so there's a lot of low hanging fruit, like, you know, <laughs> in particle physics and cosmology, the easy questions have been so answered already. It's very frustrating. Uh, and in here, like you can easily ask a question that you don't know the answer to. And so I'm actually very excited about the future of this field as a whole, this field being um, understanding the fundamental nature of reality and how it connects to our yeah. manifest image and our psychology yeah. and things like that. Well, this, um, this, it, it's in no sense like missing out on some exciting intellectual project. It's exactly the opposite. opposite Absolutely. Of that. I, agree I, mean, I, I can, uh, some agreement here as well. I mean, I think there are deep challenges. The, actually, the philosopher jo um, John Hawthorne has said, in a way, there's a kind of hard problem just getting from the increasingly esoteric physics uh two tables and chairs and so on and oh yeah totally you know, and i appreciate as i say i enjoyed your discussion with anil seth you know i appreciate you know your work in 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 how to think about the even making sense of weak emergence as you say the fundamental level it's just a vector in vector space where where are the tables how do you get so you know i mean we can both agree that there are um whether whether that's adequate to deal with consciousness is, is another issue, but the, there can still be a common project there. I think I, I certainly think you know Dennett's notion of real patterns is 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 useful for some stuff. So um, just, out, just out of interest, Philip, what sort of credence would you get? I mean, presumably, you you don't give zero credence to to any empirical hypothesis. You're a rational person. So, what sort of credence do you give to the sort of picture that Sean and I have of consciousness? You must give it some. Uh yeah, yeah. Actually, I went well. Um, I don't know, less than ten percent, I suppose. But yeah, I do. I, I mean, I, the, I, I was thinking the other day. I was just, I was watching something boring on Netflix. I think, and I like thinking about illusionism. And I suppose <laughs> you can, you can brainwash people to believe all sorts of credible, incredible things. This, this is what I, my, my mindset when I take illusionism most seriously. You can brainwash people into thinking incredible things. And, you know, if you think about in 1984, where they're brainwashing them to think two plus two is five or whatever. So, so maybe... This isn't a tendentious example at all. Yeah, go on. Evolution's brainwashed us. Maybe illusionism is true, and evolution's kind of brainwashed us into thinking um, there is this phenomenon, consciousness. Oh, right, right. Yeah, no, yeah, so, I mean, I, you know, I kind of take yeah. seriously that... That's the comfort view, yeah. The starting points, you know, for, for you guys, I think the... The data is just the data of public observation experiments, I, and I think this this is no, there's more no, data. All, all, the, yeah. all the head, all the, every, all my intuitions are data too. Everything I want to say about my experience is data. I just don't take it as you know infallible yeah. data. The fact well, that it seems to me like this is really interesting, and it does. I mean, Sean is one thing, lovely thing about Sean's book is that he's very fair to his opponents. He's fair in discussing atheism. He's very fair to the theists, and he actually discusses what would count. As good evidence for theism yeah. as opposed to atheism. I and mean, he discusses yeah. this very, it's really that if you want a defense of physicalism that is the opposite of the caricature, dogmatic, scientific <laughs> yeah. uh, person who, who, who's, who's, fund, who's just committed as a sort of, a, you know, as a kind of matter of faith to these things, that's mm. not sure. That's absolutely not. He's very, very fair. And he explains, but he explains what would have to, what sort of evidence you'd need to, 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 to raise your credence in a hypothesis like that. And yeah. Exactly. I mean, I, 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 you know, I can, I understand your intuitions. I think, Philip. I know, and I share them. But I just, I just don't, um, I, I just don't give them very high credence based on on the other sorts of uh, of the sorts of evidence I have about the nature of the way the world is and what kind of thing I am. Well, it's a question um, of starting points. It's a question of you know where do no, you start. No, especially Bayesian inference. No, that is no. Look, you, I strongly disagree with that. There's. It's not when you make the days Bayesian inference, you first have to say, what's the data? What is your starting point data for you guys? And for me, too, obviously, the one source of data is public observation experiment. I think there is another source of data or immediate awareness of feelings and experiences. That That is another starting point. Now, I might be wrong about that. I'm not saying I'm infallible. I, I agree that there's all that. All, what, what, what we have is what, what the, the, the data are statements, right? So it's all statements about how I'm inclined to describe no, my. I don't think the data is statements. I think that the, the data is um, this. Is it something that is, the, is this like something things. to which you can attach a credence? Is, 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 can you attach a credence to <laughs> the this? The reality of my. Not what's your credence in this, Philip? The reality of my pain is. is 
a starting point for so something that is, is there's some proposition there to which you would sign credence of one is there not a credence of one I, well, I, what I'm credence not... do you assign to it i don't know some 99 percent something anyway look, the zombie but... would say philip yeah <laughs> Look, I mean, you want to do fine tuning, so you you, you have a go at fine tuning, Philip. On the top, should we do fine tuning? But just yeah, go like, do fine tuning. Get the fine tuning. Um, well, let, let, let's do fine tuning, and then no, we'll do fine -tuning. To, Sean, me and Sean had a little Twitter discussion about credence recently, which I was surprised by his how high his credence was in many. But let, let, let's do fine tuning, and then maybe we can come back to that. Um, yeah. So, well, so fine tuning, I guess, refers to this. Fact, apparent fact, or at least according to physics as we have it now, it kind of looks like um, for, for life to be physically possible, the values of the constants of physics, or many of them, have to fall in a certain quite narrow range, the value of the con cosmological constant, for example. And then some people think, a lot of people think, I guess, this needs some explanation, Um why we, as it were, won the cosmic lottery, why the, the values of the constants are compatible, uh, the ones in, in the rare range that are compatible with the existence of life. And then two standard explanations here. One, God, God fix the numbers, so we get life. Another one is the multiverse. You know, maybe there's loads of universes with different values of the constants. One of them's going to be, then statistically, it's going to be highly likely that one of them be compatible with life. And as usual, I don't fit into the dichotomy nicely, and I, I don't like either of these <laughs> explanations. But just focusing on 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 the um, the multiverse, so I I've been interested in this argument that goes back over twenty years actually, and I find it really annoying that it's just been in philosophy journals and, and never got out to to a broader audience so i'm interested in you know partly interested in getting this discussion even though there's huge interest in the fine tuning nobody knows about this anyway so the argument is that the people arguing from the fine tuning to the multiverse commit what's called the inverse gambler's fallacy right so maybe so the regular gambler's fallacy um is when you've had a really bad night at the casino you keep getting bad rolls and you think, well, I'm going to have one more go. I'm bound to roll a double six this time because it'd be really unlikely that I wouldn't roll a double six all night. So I'm bound to roll a double six this time. That's a fallacy because the odds of any individual roll are the same, including the next one, one in 36 for a double six. doesn't matter how, how long you've been playing. It doesn't make it any more likely you'll get um, a double six on the next roll. Because so that's the gambler's fallacy. The inverse gambler's fallacy, you walk into a casino, you see someone rolling a double six, and you think, oh, they must have been playing all night. Because it's really unlikely if they'd just had one roll that it would be a double six. Again, it's kind of the same fallacy because you've only observed one roll. The odds of that one roll are one in 36, the same as any other individual roll. No matter how long this guy's been playing, it doesn't make it any more likely. It's irrelevant to, to the only role you've observed. Okay, that's the inverse gambler's fallacy. So people want to say that that is the mistake. People arguing for the multiverse on the basis of fine tuning. Not, not, there might be other philosophical reasons for taking seriously the, the multiverse. But those arguing on the basis of fine tuning are making the same mistake. We observe this, the improbable fine tuning in our universe. We think, wow. There must be loads of other universes with really crap numbers in their physics. But the thought is it's the same mistake. We've only observed one universe. No matter how many other universes there are, it doesn't make it any more likely that our universe will be fine-tuned. And that is that is what our evidence is. So it's the same kind of fallacy. I was curious to know your thoughts on this. Well, I do think it's a confused situation right now, honestly. I, I think that my own views are not completely settled, but still I think that a lot of physicists and a lot of philosophers say things I disagree with about fine-tuning and the anthropic principle and and the whole story. And uh, But again, since my own views are only halfway baked right now, I can't be too uh, dogmatic about it. I do think the particular argument that you just laid out is a mistake in, in a very, uh, there is a mistake in it in a very particular way. Uh, the analogy, anyway, is not 
good. The analogy that you walk into a casino and you see someone roll the double sixes versus, uh, um, well, and then you try to conclude they must have been rolling all night. Because the, the point is that we conditionalize on the fact that we saw double sixes, right? We exist. Like, that. that's already known. Like, that. there was no um, option that we could have seen anything else. We're not going to find ourselves in a universe that does not allow for us to exist, okay? So the question that we're addressing is we have, it, we're just being good Bayesians, and we have two propositions in front of us. One is... Uh, there's a single universe with some values of constants. And again, this is more like the standard picture. I'm not, I, th I think we can do better than this, but the standard picture would be there's either a single universe with certain values of the constants or there's a multiverse. And in different parts of that multiverse, um, you're going to get different values of the constants and some will be hospitable to life and some will not. And the question is, what are the chances that in those two theories somewhere it's hospitable to life? That's why the analogy is not good. It's not that here we observed it this one place and it's hospitable to life. But the question is, given these two grand theories of cosmology, what was the chances that life would be able to exist anywhere? And I think it's clearly more likely in the uh, multiverse case. So if you buy that argument, I think that you, you would say that, you know, the, the fact that we exist, I, I think there is something that is legitimate in asking when you're comparing cosmological theories, um, what is the probability? I, I don't want to quite say a priori, but at least, you know, before so, some things that we know, what is the probability that would predict the existence of people like us somewhere? That's the question being asked. I think that's a legitimate question to ask. Um, you know, I, I think that it's very hard to completely understand how to ask, how to formulate that question accurately, because people like us is not well defined in some sense. There's what we call a reference class problem and stuff like that. I'm actually in a minority here because I think that you should ask for the existence of people exactly like me. I, I think that I should be able to ask what is the probability that I would exist in this different scenario. And, and that's different than most other people think. But the, the big unanswered question that I don't know is, um, you know, what is the, what do you mean by a single universe with, I don't know, randomly chosen constants or something like that? Like what ensemble are you choosing these constants from? How in the world do you answer the question? If there were only one universe, what is the chances that someone like me would exist? I have no way of knowing. I have this feeling that it's less likely than in a multiverse, but I can't really rigorously back that up. So what I'm saying is I do have an issue with the conventional fine tuning problem, but it's not that inverse gambler's fallacy issue that you brought up. Yeah, that's really interesting. There's lots there. I mean, the point you were saying towards the end there, the question of how we get the probabilities, there are really interesting challenges there. And I've got some thoughts about that, but just staying on this issue. So I, I agree with you. The question is, how, sh how sh ought we to construe our evidence? Is it, are a universe is fine-tuned or a universe is fine-tuned? And you might think, well, can't we take both? Because this universe is fine-tuned entails our universe is fine-tuned, um, but there are clearly there are clearly contexts in which it's not permissible to do that. I mean, the uncontroversial case that I just gave of the the the, the casino where you you only saw one roll dice being rolled, um, it would be wrong in that context to take your evidence to be a double six was rolled by this guy. Okay, but you correctly said, well, look, there are disanalogies. And lots of people want to bring in the selection effect here. We couldn't have observed an unfine-tuned universe. Um, that sounded a little bit close to what you're saying. But I think I think we can adjust the analogy. I mean, I think there are theoretical issues, but just we can adjust the analogy to make a sort of artificial selection effect. And it still seems like there's a mistake here. So, so let me just try this analogy on you, right? Sure. So suppose I am uh, the, the product of IVF, right? The embryo that became me was created through IVF. And then suppose I discover one day that um, the, the doctor who fertilized the egg had a kind of nervous breakdown around this time. 
and they for some reason they they they, they roll dice to see if they fertilize the egg. Right? Like, oh no, so, I've made a panpsychist. What am I going to do? Yeah, <laughs> I can understand. Well, they didn't know that they were that was they were worried about it. Um, they yeah. So let's say they you know they roll twenty dice and said I'm only going to fertilize the egg if if they all come up six, right? And um, and they did, and you find this out, and you find out like they only did it this once, right? The doctor only did it this once, and they you know got some therapy, and you find that out, and you think, oh my god, how lucky that I lived. What you wouldn't say is, oh, there must be other doctors doing this that that are getting bad rolls and not fertilizing eggs, right? That would be crazy because. All you know about is this the one this one doctor did it and did it just that once. It doesn't it has no bearing on it if there are other doctors doing it or not. So I think and that seems analogous to our situation, at least if we're thinking of the standard the kind of inflationary cosmology. Um, you know, all we know is our universe is fine-tuned and you know, so you see, I think that seems to be a perfect analogy. And in that context, we should think not that um, you know our life was the right number came up in this way, but my life came up in this way. So anal if, if it's a fitting analogy, we should say, oh, you know, it's fine tune should be our evidence. If it's a fitting analogy, it's not a evidence for design because, you know, it was just a roll of the dice, right? It, I mean, the, the doctor well, didn't cook the books to produce you. It, it just, just happened. Well, it's another question. I don't know whether... It's another question um, whether this is evidence for design or something like but design. If, that is, if, that's, if that's analogous to our situation, then it just seems pure luck. Yeah, okay. But, I mean, I guess what we're focusing on is is whether whether the multiverse inference... Does that... Does, the multiverse inference is justified and... I think, you know, I, I, I don't have... I think this is a confusing issue. And again, I'm not going to have strong opinions here, but I, I, I do worry about... And I don't completely understand the the new scenario that you just suggested, okay. Philip. So maybe maybe we can explore it more, maybe not. But my point is that um, there's an order of operations going on here that is important. The reason why I did not like the initial gambler's analogy fallacy is because the question being answered is not, I saw one thing and it happened to be double sixes. The question that I, I'm trying to address is, what is the chances the double sixes would arise somewhere, mm. right? And so I'm not quite sure if that's the right, if that question maps onto your analogy either. If I had a theory where many, many, many doctors did this and, you know, eventually it worked sometimes versus a theory where only one doctor did it. And I knew after the fact that I arose as the, the product of a doctor doing this thing. Yeah, I think the theory where many doctors did this thing is probably more likely because there's more people like me arising in that in that case. Yeah, so... I mean, I sort of feel like you're you're, you're adopting the what is perhaps fairly I mean, you'd know better than me a standard approach of theoretical physics, and I guess I'm challenging whether whether that standard approach is warranted, and whether I mean whether the selection effect makes any difference. I mean, I think I think so, it seems to me like when selection effects make a difference, it's because your initial take on the evidence it, they show that your initial take on the evidence was wrong. Right, so to, I mean, example from Nick Bostrom when um, when um, Roosevelt won the election in the thirties versus Alf Langdon, I think the, the opponent was, um, and the Reader's Digest did a big poll before the election, and um, um, it looked the the poll said it was it was overwhelming that Langdon was going to win, right? But then they but why was that wrong? Because they did the poll with by by a telephone and only wealthy people had telephones so yeah. so initially you think oh there's good evidence that langdon's going to win and then you once you take into account the selection effect um you find out oh it's only evidence that the wealthy people support langdon um but in the case of fine tuning you know you look at the problem you know you think oh god it's let's say you know there's all sorts of complexities here with the probabilities and so on but let's say it looks like you know life's really improbable then you then you bring in the selection effect you think, well, we wouldn't have observed it. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference to the probability. So, so I, 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 I'm worried. Whether wait, wait, they... sorry. Explain that. I didn't understand that last. What, what well, doesn't, doesn't make any make... difference to what? To the Bayesian calculation, like, like in 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 the Lang in the Roosevelt case, our initial take on the evidence was, the evidence is think to think in Bayesian terms, really unlikely if. 
if um, Langdon's going to lose, really likely if Langdon's going to win. But then we take into account the selection effect and we say, actually, it's not. It's rather right. evidence that's really unlikely if the wealthy people right. aren't going to vote for him. But what what changes when you, in terms of the probabilities of, you know, uh, look, you know, that it's life is really unlikely in a universe like ours. Say we can make sense of that. Then you take into account the selection effect. It still life is really unlikely in a universe like ours. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't change. It doesn't change the probabilities that are relevant to the Bayesian calculation. So it, sh it just shouldn't make any difference. So I think physicists taking into account this anthropic stuff, I worry it's just actually a theoretical mistake. Yeah, I mean, I get that. I mean, I think, this, so the way I would say it maybe is, <laughs> so I'm going to say it in a much simpler way, and maybe because I've oversimplified it too much, and you, you can tell me. Um, it, it's the problem of old evidence, right? Like if yeah. if we weren't here, we wouldn't be here discussing it. Therefore, the fact that we're here discussing it is literally zero evidence because if we conditionalize on us here discussing it, then you know we we are only in universes that are like that that are the fact that we're in a universe that is hospitable to us tells us nothing about the fundamental nature of, of cosmology or anything like that. It couldn't we couldn't have had that discussion under any other circumstances. But I do think, and you know, maybe that's right. I, 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 I'm actually not sure about whether that's right or not. But I do think that there's just it, that's just an extreme version of a more reasonable thing, which is that what we want to do in cosmology is, again, to have some much better set of priors for what kinds of universes there are, so we can discuss the probability of different things would happen, and then talk about features of the universe in addition to me being here. Like I can conditionalize on me being here, the chances that you are here or something like that. You know, things that are not necessarily uh, preconditions for even talking or thinking about this thing at all. And there, you know, I, I think that it would be much easier to live in a universe where only one person existed, right? Than, uh, than many, many people. So I think that there's a more productive version of anthropic reasoning that it, that is much more careful about what the set of possibilities is and what the priors are and goes through it carefully. I, I'm, I'm sympathetic, in other words, to the overall worry that we're too slapdash in our applications of anthropic reasoning. That I'm, I'm, I'm completely on board with. Okay. Could I, I'll get this could I just thought, make a you. point there about the, what you're calling the selection effect? I'm not sure that's the right term, but isn't the point that, isn't the point that it, that what we're calling the selection effect here undermines our sense that there's anything special about this universe. I mean, it's the comparison is like with someone who wins a lottery and they think oh, there must be something really lucky about my ticket because it made me win. And so this is a really special ticket. Intrinsically, there's something special about this ticket. How on earth you know, did I happen to get this wonderful ticket? Well, there's nothing special about it. It's only special from your point of view because it made you a winner. It's not special from anybody else's point of view. In fact, it's the opposite. Okay. Well, okay, Isn't but wait, hold on. But th this is this is actually very good. So you're you're making me you're you're giving me a better thing to say than I said before. So sorry to okay, interrupt go, you, go. but but I'll put it. No, in. Go, say it. So let's say that I found a lottery ticket. I or, or, sorry, I bought a lottery ticket and it won. Okay. Um, and I say, well, you know, okay. So let's imagine that I'm trying to distinguish between two theories. For some reason, I have good credence in one of them, in, in both of them. Uh, one of them is. It, the lottery was completely fair. Everyone chose different numbers. Uh, the chances of me winning were small, but I happened to be the winner. So that was a selection yeah. effect. But then yeah. someone says, no, 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 actually there was a mistake. And this time all the lottery numbers that were handed out were the same. And that's also the one that was picked. Does the fact that you're a lottery winner increase your credence in that theory? You know, I think maybe. What, what, can you say that again? What's this? What, what's the hypothesis? I'm distinguishing between a, a case where you really were the only winner, uh, very unlikely, of a lottery. Of yeah. course, someone's going to win the lottery if you play it enough times. And if you post select on that, it will seem surprising to you. But if then you're given another alternative where actually everyone won the lottery that time, then you're less surprised by the fact that you won. And maybe that's a reason to believe that theory. In other words, let's put it yet another way. The analogy is there, there are features of the world that, you know, we, and I don't have a really good example of this. So I've been trying to think of one. I don't quite have it. 
But you know, let's just imagine there was there was something that we observed about the world, it wasn't our existence or anything like that, that just seemed it always was like this. You know, Gosh, again and again we saw the same kind of thing. It just there was no explanation for it. Okay, but you know, it just was always like that. And then someone comes up with a new theory who says, "Oh, actually, here is why it's always going to be like that under this theory." Yeah, you know, we already had the evidence. Like we didn't gather any new evidence. We just got a new theory. And you know, would you give substantial credence to that theory because it does explain why this weird thing exists? And I think if it's not specifically about our existence, you would probably say yes. Like it, it's playing an explanatory role for this weird feature of the world. I mean, the, the problem now, is, admittedly, our existence is a special case. But I don't think that the overall logic is completely crazy. Yeah. The problem is, that, that, I mean. At least the multiverse of inflationary cosmology doesn't make our universe more like oh, the fine tuning of our universe more likely. So again, it comes back to how should we construe our evidence? So I mean, to be clear, I certainly think if we had independent evidence, um, maybe from in, you know explaining inflation or something for a multiverse of the right kind, that would remove any puzzle puzzlement about the fine tuning, right? Because then, you know, then there's going to be a universe. We happen to be in it. It's more like the lottery case. But the question is, in the absence of that, when we've just got our universe and it's fine-tuned, I am inclined to think it's not permissible to postulate other universes because what we want explained is the evidence the one universe we, we, you, we've observed. You, the fact you may be right about that, Philip, but... I. I you're starting with the assumption, you keep talking about being fine-tuned for life, as if that itself is something unlikely that needs to be explained. Well, suppose, you know, why is it something unlikely that just needs, why isn't this just a random universe that just, like a random lottery ticket, that, you know, we just happen to be the winner? It looks special to us because it made, it brought us into existence, but I just make it special from some, you know, sort of transcendental point of view. It's just, it's just like the ticket. Now, if it happened that there were certain features of this universe that were intrinsically special, not just special because it made us, suppose that I'd bought, a, a, suppose that the, the person who won the lottery, well, this is an example I gave in, the, in a blog post wrote about this, was the, the sister of the chief executive of the lottery company, or perhaps, say, the most deserving person in the country won the lottery. You might suspect there was some some fixing going on because there was something really special about the person who about the ticket that won it was it belonged to to some very significant person from anyone's perspective but the fact that it made brought us into existence is no more significant than that it brought the lottery winner into existence it's significant only from our perspective there's nothing that needs explaining yeah. you know well, yeah, it's I, not a special universe it's absolutely. only special because we're in it keith and i agree on this and, and you you might be interested in this you might you may um this perspective, whether or not you agree with it. And Keith has an interesting recent blog post on this. So, I mean, I think actually the fine tuning is only interesting if I'm mean, putting on one side problems about the probabilities and whether physics will yeah. change and so on. I think the fine tuning is only interesting if you think life is of objective value, like that, you know, people falling in love and writing poetry. This is of objective value and the other universes are objectively of less value. I think that's because then, and we both agree on it, because then there is something objectively special about that combination. It's the one compatible with objective facts about value. If that is true, that's very interesting because, you know, lots of naturalistic physical, phys 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 physicists and physicalists like Max Tegmark, like Richard Dawkins, you know, take the fine tuning seriously if implicit in taking it seriously is a commitment to objective moral value, that's kind of interesting. Oh, but, we, know Philip, uh, we know Sean's view on that. But yeah, yeah no. so I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I, I do think that's a precondition. Um, I happen to think, do believe in objective value. So then I'm, I do think it kind of needs some kind of explanation that it's the numbers are right for a universe of value if that is indeed the case. Um, but yeah, anyway. I don't know. Where have we exa exhausted we, this one? Or? Should we do a few questions, Philip? Should we do some audience questions? Have you got time for some questions? If, if, if Sean yeah, has sure. time. Unless you wanted to say something else on that, no. No, you know, I, I think it's it's um 
let, let me just maybe it just the final word would be reiterating what I take to be the standard cosmologist view and which I don't completely accept, but just to get just be clear on what to not straw man it. I think the, the, the basic idea is that we imagine we're comparing two scenarios for the world. One is a multiverse and one is a single shot universe, if you want to call it that. And maybe your your priors are one percent multiverse and ninety-nine percent single shot universe. But then someone points out that in the space of all single shot universes, the chances that things will be hospitable to life are way less than 10 to the minus two. They're 10 to the minus 100. And then you say, so, okay, within all of the single shot universes, most of them are not hospitable to life. Whereas in, even if it's 1% prior for multiverse, it will be hospitable for life. Therefore, the fact that we live in a universe hospitable for life increases our credence in the multiverse. Um, I don't know if that logic works, but it's not illogical. It's not. I don't think it's a fallacy. I think that the the real question is, you know, these these roles, the, the extent to which we're allowed to update on the basis of old evidence, which I think is a tricky Bayesian problem. Mm. It's certainly tricky. Okay, uh, Canadian Catholic saying, do my questions, but so if there are questions up the chat, if you could just write them again, write quick Q or question, uh, so I can distinguish them. Then we'll ask questions that are coming up now. But anyway, we've already got one from Digital Gnosis, who's hosting our Christmas special next month. Um, does Sean think that we need to know the necessary and sufficient reasons for life, including exotic life, to assess the relevant probability spaces for uh, LPUs? Oh, like, well, I guess that's life permissible universes. Oh, yeah, we've argued a bit on Twitter about fine tuning Digital Gnosis and I. Uh, yeah. Did, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, we need to know more than we do now. <laughs> I think that we know pitifully little about the uh, conditions under which life is possible. I think that's a real problem with all of these discussions. You know, I think that the Fermi problem and things like that, why haven't we discovered life elsewhere in our galaxy? The simplest explanation is that there isn't any technologically advanced life in our galaxy because it's just unlikely, either because life is unlikely or... Uh, multicellular life is unlikely, or intelligent life is unlikely, or technological life is unlikely. I don't know which one it is, um, or or if any of them. So uh, I just think that uh, the thing I strongly think is that people very often make the following mistake. They say the number of intelligent civilizations in the universe is A times B, and A is the number of planets life could form on, and B is the probability. And A is so large that how can A times B be small? <laughs> well, that is a very elementary mathematical error. I can always find a number B such that A times B is very, very small, no matter how big you pick A. So I think that we should be humble about our ignorance in these questions. And it's certainly even worse when we get to questions, not just of the existence of life in our universe, but the comparison of the probability of life between different kinds of universes. But isn't it the case, Sean, just to follow this up that, uh, and you'll know better than me, but on. Um... On some of these combinations, there can be there's no chemical complexity at all. You've just got, say, hydrogen, the simplest element, or most extreme with the cosmological constant. You either get the universe collapsing back on itself, or things shooting away so fast that two protons don't even come to clump together. So, it, do we really have to decide necessary and sufficient conditions for life before we can just see? Look, if there's just hydrogen, if there's no chemical complexity whatsoever, there's not going to be life, can't we? Isn't that reasonable? It seems reasonable, but I would still be humble about it. If someone handed me the fundamental equation of the core theory and says, could life exist under this? I would be stuck. I would have no idea. You would not even be able to predict the periodic table, much less, you know, uh, organic chemistry or anything like that. So it seems reasonable to me that if the cosmological constant were too big or if only hydrogen existed or if neutrons were lighter than protons that life could not exist but i don't know all the conditions so i'm going to be open-minded about that a little bit fair enough uh potatoa onion says mr sean Carr, are you a dangerous man are you a dangerous man i don't think so not very much not very okay. dangerous we're getting questions about fine tuning now rather than kind of, but uh, LSJ Farrow says, is wondering about Roger, po Roger Penrose's critique of the many worlds. I think it's the Boltzmann mm -hmm. brain problem. If it's true that there's overwhelming more probable, overwhelming more probable that we should be in a small patch of order in our galaxy and the rest of the universe should be chaotic. So yeah, so Roger Penrose's much discussed Boltzmann brain problem to the multi argument against the multiverse. <coughs> 
Uh, so I'm confused because I, I know Roger Penrose and I know the Boltzmann brain argument, but I don't know that there's any connection between them. Um, there is a Boltzmann brain argument that if the universe largely is randomly fluctuating and it lasts forever, uh, then you would, with overwhelming probability, predict a very disorderly universe, even after you conditionalize on anything you want to conditionalize on. So let's conditionalize on, you know, we're here, we're having this conversation, we're here on Earth, okay, et cetera. You would still predict with overwhelming probability that as soon as you look outside, there's nothing there, it has disappeared. We thought it was there because, you know, it randomly fluctuated into our brains, et cetera. And that's no way to go through life. So I wrote a paper about this also, why Boltzmann brains are bad. The problem is not Boltzmann brains, because I'm not a Boltzmann brain. I'm a whole person. But the problem is Boltzmann universes and Boltzmann regions of universes, right? That's really the problem. It's a, it's a self-undermining, cognitively unstable situation. So, okay, so the, the result is that you should give very, very low credence to the fact that we live to the idea that we live in a randomly fluctuating eternal universe. But most theories of the multiverse are not randomly fluctuating and eternal. So I don't see why this is a critique of the multiverse at all. You discussed this in your debate with William Lane Craig, I think, didn't you? I think maybe that's connected. That's his argument against explaining fine tuning into the multi in, in terms of the multiverse. Yeah, no, but I think the Boltzmann brain probably. argument is a very good one, and it rules out, or it it argue, it suggests we should give very, very low credence to a certain kind of cosmological scenario. But there's plenty right. of other kinds of cosmological scenarios that are multiverse based or whatever. Yeah. So we use it as a kind of constraint to narrow yeah. down. Okay, Canadian Catholics got his question. Um, it's a nice name. D does the mind conceptualize universals? If so, how is this possible on physicalism? I mean, modulo some technical definitions that I'm unaware of. Sure, two plus two equals four. I can conceptualize that. That's a universal. I don't see any reason why that would be hard to do under physicalism. I guess there might be a sort of a platonic view in the background. There might be, depending on how you think about mathematics, maybe if we're uh, our mathematical knowledge or something. But then I suppose these worries would arise only if you're, if you're a Platonist. I guess you'd reject the Platonism. Yeah, you know, I think, again, uh, this is similar to something that Keith was saying before. If you start from an assumption that these universals are somehow spooky, <laughs> and then you're wondering how we can ever be in contact with them, you might worry. But uh, they're not. They're just sort of, uh, you know, results of processes of physical things going on in our brains. Yeah. I think there's something, uh, there's something behind all this. Which, uh, I, I Just reading Sean's book, and I... <laughs> There seems to be a sort of anxiety among some people about physicalism um, that it that they're that somehow it's taking something away from them, or, or, or that it's it's that it's a that it's a somehow an, uh, not a sort of humanistic picture that it's that it's diminishing them in some way. And I think Sean's book does a good, very good job of com combating that, addressing that worry, and it's 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 one that I, I've never felt. I mean, I like to think that I'm a you know a fairly humanistic kind of person. I enjoy poetry, I enjoy fiction, I enjoy I enjoy ghost stories and things. Um, I, I don't feel that that this view diminishes the the, the physicalist view diminishes reality, takes anything. My view of consciousness, I don't think, it makes consciousness less significant, less wonderful, if it doesn't have this in fundamental, intrinsic quality to it that can't be, why should it? I mean, if, if it is just a fundamental thing, well, it's just a fundamental thing, but so, well, that's nothing special about it being fundamental. I mean, you know, after all, you know, the, the, you know, the quantum wave uh, function, whatever, is supposed to be fundamental, but it doesn't make it more or less special. I, I, I just don't, what's, <laughs> what's meaningful is meaningful for me because of the way I interact with it and what it, you know, how it affects me and how it shapes my life and my interactions with people. That's where meaning lies in this interaction between me and the world around me and with other people. It's not in some fundamental value that grounds it all. And I just don't see this picture. Sorry, I'm going on off on a little rant here. I don't really know why, but um, uh, I, I just... I, I, I don't understand this worry, and I do think that it underlies some of the positions people take. I'm not saying, I'm not accusing Philip of this, but um, although who knows what our motivations are, but it's a worry that I've never grasped. And if you do have it, I really would 
and people listening do have it, I really would encourage you to read John's book because, I, again, I think it does a good job of of giving us a picture of the world, which is ever so, uh, just as rich as we thought, <laughs> as we thought it was. It's not taking anything away. It's not telling us we know we're just atoms and that's or just wave functions or whatever. That's it. The world's still packed with all the stuff we thought it was packed with. It's just that it, we can understand how it's packed with that stuff. We don't have to take any of this stuff as fundamental. Anyway, sorry, think, I'm um, ranting, but yeah. it, it, it's an no. This, I think this is a good rant to have because this is mm. where the rubber meets the road here. Like this is what yeah. matters about a lot of these conversations, and I think mm. that. When it comes to questions of purpose and meaning, uh, I'm very much on your side in the sense that I never felt the worry. In fact, I, I feel kind of uncomfortable at the idea that our purpose in lives is given to us from outside yeah. by somebody yeah. else. <laughs> I mean, that, that makes me less happy mm -hmm. and fulfilled. But on the other side, I do get it in the case of morality, like in the case of human action uh, being right and wrong. Um, I feel the loss in in the sense that there's just no way to figure that out ultimately, and different people are going to have different opinions on it, and that's the end of the conversation. And and I'm left um, not knowing the answers to a whole bunch of questions. You know, like would it be better? I, I talked about this on an Ask Me Anything episode of my own podcast that uh, right. I recently did. Um, what's better? A, a, a world where the human race lasts for another thousand years and everyone is really happy and fulfilled, or if it lasts for another billion years, but everyone's kind of miserable. You know, I honestly don't know. And I, it frustrates me that I don't know. And I, it's not knowable in some sense. And so I get that. But I think that, that that's a case where we have to face up to how the world works. Yeah, we might reach for some things that, that are not obtainable, but I... I I, I mean, this is one thing I'd see in, in Daniel Dennett's work. I think that you know he 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 takes things like free will and consciousness and intentionality, the aboutness of thoughts, and he shows that they can't be quite what you you know what you be theoretically think they are. But then he shows that there is something there that's every bit as effective and <laughs> valuable as as what you thought was there. You know, he talks about the the kinds of free will worth having. They may not be the kind you thought you could have, but you can have a kind of a sort of autonomy. There's every bit as in fact more valuable because it actually is effective in the world, and you know, it, it makes makes a real difference. So I think we can. I don't I don't see why the, this picture should be less rich. In fact, I think it might be more rich because it, it may not answer all questions. I agree, but it may it will answer a lot of questions that that, that that couldn't be answered on the other picture. The rewards are far greater than the losses if there are any losses. What do you, but do you, Thomas Nagel has talked about um, the desire for cosmic harmony, the desire to see your life, the meaning of your life, somehow connected to the meaning of reality as a whole. And obviously, this is fulfilled in a religious picture of reality. And he he's an atheist, but he says, "I feel this. I can't help it." Now, of course, you know, I we should be going for the view not we'd like to be true, but the view that's most likely to be true. But still, I don't think that's an illegitimate hmm. thing to desire, uh, you know, and to be sad about if you think the universe doesn't turn out like that. Yeah, I mean, certainly there are things that we might want to be. I mean, I would, you know, I mean, we've all lost people, I'm sure, in our lives, and we would, we would wish that we could see them again. I'm sure it, we, anyone who's lost someone knows that. So it's, it's certainly that this picture doesn't give us everything we want. But it sounded like you were saying, you know, there's no loss to to no, a naturalistic worldview i think this there is a loss in the sense that if if at least you have this desire for cosmic harmony that nagel talks about yeah. we shouldn't pretend oh you know humanism is just as good Fair enough. i mean we, you know, we may lose some is. things uh i think we gain others and i i don't think we, i certainly don't think we lose them in the way that that some people think that there's just there's just sort of dust and ashes <laughs> if you have a physical right. issue yeah, yeah, that's 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 i don't have any sympathy with that but yeah. yeah, no, I well, think that, maybe... that's the important thing. The idea that it's illegitimate somehow to care about things if yeah. you're just a physicalist. <laughs> like, yeah. that's just yeah. weird. Yeah. But I do get, I do take the point that, you know, um, we want some, you know, would it be better if the world, if, if what happened to human beings in the world were always just? Like, would we like a world better where virtue was rewarded and evil was punished? Oh, maybe I, I could I could see that that might be a good thing. Like no innocent babies were sick or dying and, you know, no crooks, you know, became rich and famous and whatever. Like I could see that. And that's a loss. We don't have that. And so, OK, I think that, you know, there's 
like Philip said, we, you know, I don't want to put too much emphasis on the fact that this this worldview is more rewarding because right. that's just admitting that we have a bias toward it in some sense. Yeah, like I, 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 I'm happy to emphasize its rewards, but you know, I would certainly like to have yeah. an afterlife when I was very happy after I died. Like that's a loss. Yeah, that, that's a pretty obvious one to me. Uh, yeah. And this is another point again, that you make in your book, that we have to be aware of biases on both sides. We all, we, we um, yeah. you know, they're absolutely, absolutely. Sometimes this is put as like psychoanalyzing someone on my side. Like this is why you really believe it because you want to. And yeah, no, you know, yeah. people like David Chalmers and Luke Roloffs. I've got some maybe slightly exotic views about morality, but they're total <laughs> atheist secularists who yeah. want to be materialists. They just yeah. don't think it works out. And I think you know, I think a lot of people. Yeah, if if this can account for consciousness then yeah, it's consciousness is just as good. But I think a lot of people have the intuition that a, that a purely material world wouldn't contain consciousness. And I happen to think that intuition is sound. I don't think it would, but... would matter necessarily if there were those motivations, because if they motivated you to argue strongly for your position, um, that would be good. You know, we want the strongest arguments possible. And if you really want something to be true and you're determined to you know, really put in the effort to get the best arguments, that's good for, for everyone because we don't want to defeat, if we, we don't want to defeat, if we, you know, we don't want to argue against a weak version of your position, we want to argue against the strongest version. So I don't think that motivations like that are yeah, actually yeah. a bad thing in force. I mean, it's unconscious at an thing. unconscious level, who knows how we're motivated. Should we, um, should we get a couple more questions? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Bit, sorry, I, I uh, hijacked this Some, bit, some people asking about my panpsychism. You'll have to come to the <laughs> Ask Me Anything Christmas special to ask yeah. those questions. Uh, Hume's Disciple here asks, mm -hmm. well, this is a, a question that I think you've had a lot, but people want to ask someone, defending your kind of view, is the multiverse hypothesis testable? I guess you could you could use the many worlds if you like as what is meant there. Well, I think actually I don't want to use many worlds. Well, oh. let, let, let me be more explicit. Many worlds is very different from the cosmological multiverse that we've been talking mm. about here. The cosmological multiverse is the one where there are really regions just far away outside our cosmological cosmological horizon that we cannot get to where conditions are very different local laws of physics are very different i mean that's that's the multiverse that is relevant to questions of fine tuning and things like that many worlds is is completely different there's no physical location for these other worlds and they exist all the time they pop into existence because of every quantum measurement event um, and in fact, I would, even though many worlds is sort of metaphysically much more radical, I would give it a lot higher credence than the cosmological multiverse, which is much more speculative. And many worlds is 100% testable because it's falsifiable. The whole underlying framework of the theory is quantum systems always obey the Schrodinger equation, full stop. And it's very easy to do experiments looking for deviations from the Schrodinger equation. And people are doing those experiments. And if they find some, many worlds will be falsified and that'll be it. Like that's that's what you want out of a good testable theory. Um, the cosmological multiverse is a much more philosophically interesting case for exactly this, this case, th this question, because um, I can't imagine falsifying it in any straightforward way. Uh, I mean, it's literally talking about things that are impossible for me to observe, but it plays an explanatory role in things that we do observe for exactly the kinds of questions that we've been talking about. Why do the conditions within our observable universe have this feature rather than that feature? Well, if you conditionalize on existing within a multiverse with many different features, you can explain that, whereas otherwise they are inexplicable. So rather than being uh, slightly overly naively Popperian about it and saying, well, you can't falsify it, then it isn't science. I think you have to take a more nuanced Bayesian point of view. And I'm not making fun of Karl Popper himself here. I'm making fun of the physicists who quote Karl Popper and have never read him. Uh, I, you know, Karl Popper actually kind of liked the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. He liked it more than Copenhagen. He didn't like it as many as he had his own interpretation of quantum mechanics uh, that did not become very popular. But it's it, it's a subtle issue. And I think that the cosmological multiverse, I wrote a paper about this also. It's called Beyond Falsifiability that you can read, where I make the point where it's exactly the cosmological multiverse where the things Popper cared about are very relevant, but this overly naive uh, um, invocation of falsifiability is not helping us answer the question. Brilliant. That's yeah. I I should say George Williams, who's um, fan of the show, who's um, read 
your paper to me and the response. And he wanted to ask about this testability, but also wanted to ask um, why you've got such confidence in the core theory, given there are many interpretations of quantum mechanics. And we don't, he said, um, we haven't pinned down the bo the, bo the born rule probabilities. I was not sure about that, but, uh, but, you know, given that there are these different interpretations of quantum mechanics and maybe we don't know what's going to come up from um, quantum gravity and, I, I was and connected with this. I was surprised on on Twitter. You said like 0.95 credence for many worlds or something. Um, I mean, shouldn't we? I, so I, I could see the case for many worlds that it's sort of arguably the simplest interpretation of quantum mechanics. But does that reduce the other interpretations to like less than five percent? I mean, surely we should give some credence, especially maybe quant maybe quantum gravity considerations may may, may collapse look more probable or something. Yeah. Um, Anyway, there's two. Well, these are two very different sets of questions here. Yeah, sorry, I've learned to get <laughs> one two is, questions. Yeah, I mean, one is about. Um, sorry, what was the first one about? It was about the, the well, core just, theory. How can we be so confident that the, in terms of thinking about, how can you be so confident that the core theory is is the final theory of the matter in our body and brains? Oh, when yeah. there are lots of different interpretations it, of quantum mechanics unresolved. So again, I would I would recommend people read the paper that I wrote about this, which was not the one responding to Philip, but the other one. Um, and you know, the point is that we know enough about the Born rule. We know enough. Maybe we don't know everything about it, but we know enough that no variation in it that is compatible with our current experimental data is going to have an effect on human life. So the core theory is not necessarily, in fact, I don't think it is the most fundamental theory. It doesn't explain black holes and things like that. So I, have a, I literally have a little picture that I drew just to make mm. this very clear in the, in the paper about, you know, the layers, right? And there's a layer with human beings and stars and things like that. And there's a layer with quantum fields. And there's an underlying layer beneath that. And that, that might be very, very different kind of stuff. And it might be, you know, not even quantum mechanics. Stephen Wolfram thinks it's some discrete hypergraph model or something like that. So 100% open to that. But either that underlying level gives rise to the core theory as that level of emergence, or it doesn't. And if it does, then everything that I say is, is true. And if it doesn't, then you're going to have to explain why you haven't shown up in experiments yet or why you are radically changing the expectations of effective field theory. So I just I, I think there's plenty of room for new ontology at the fundamental level. I just don't think it's going to have any effect on the quantum field theory on which everyday life supervenes. And in terms of... Oh, why and in the multiverse, yeah, the, the many worlds such credence. Low, such low credence as to other... I can understand your case for putting the highest credence in that, but such low credence... I mean, the, take GRW, you know, we might... Surely we should be more open to the possibility that we get empirical evidence that for collapse in, in the ongoing research program there. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, all of these other... so. To those of people who are listening who are not experts, you know, there's there's several competing models for how quantum mechanics works at the fundamental level, and these are not really interpretations. These are literally different physical theories at this at this stage. We still call them interpretations for historical reasons, but they're actually different physical theories. In some cases, we're very explicitly uh, trying to test them experimentally. In other cases, the experimental predictions overlap, so it's harder to do. Um, so here is my take on this. You know, we have many worlds. Many worlds is a theory that says there is a wave function and it obeys the Schrodinger equation. That's it. That's the entire theory. There's no more to the theory than that. All this talk about worlds and collapses and et cetera, that emerges from the theory at a higher level in exactly the way that we've been talking about. Now, there are people who, bless their hearts, they question whether or not the world that we observe can emerge from that so, such a simple underlying ontology, whether you can get the probabilities and the structure and things like that. And I think we've done it. I think that we've written papers showing you how to do that. And if you believe that, then all the other attempts are just bringing a battering ram to an open door. <laughs> They're making much more complicated versions of the underlying laws that don't do any more explanatory work than the one we already have. Uh, it, so if you believe that many worlds just fails on its own rights, then I get it. I don't agree, but I get it. Um, but if you don't, then adding all these new ingredients, there are pilot wave theories that add new variables and parts of the ontology. 
There are spontaneous collapse theories that have the Schrodinger equation being violated some of the time. There are epistemic theories that don't want to talk about the real world and so forth. And you know, all of these are just working hard to address a question I think we've already answered. Right. And specifically when you bring up quantum gravity, that's the best reason to believe many worlds. All of the other theories, I, I'm pretty sure this is true, but this could be exaggerating, but literally all the other theories have things like locations in space playing a fundamental role in many worlds that's an emergent thing and i don't think that fundamental that that space is a fundamental thing so i think that things like pilot wave theories or spontaneous collapse theories are pretty straightforwardly incompatible with the best things the best guesses we have about quantum gravity we don't have it figured out yet so maybe i'm wrong about that yeah. so many worlds is not only the simplest theory it not only fits the data it also gives us the best chance of quantizing gravity why would i waste my credences on other ideas you just shouldn't give a little bit more credence to just evidence changing in surprising ways i, I mean i would just be surprised any scientific but that's always true has that's always true like at some point you move on at some point you know, I, this is maybe this is my difference between being a scientist versus being a philosopher. Sometimes you ask questions and then you answer them and then you move on to other questions. <laughs> could, could I could I just intervene to ask a question here, playing a little bit of devil's advocate? I mean, um, you know, Philip likes to, to, to say that um, you know, physics just it, it's, it just gives a mathematical description of the world that science, science generally just gives a mathematical description of the world. Uh, and one of the motives, motivations for the panpsychism is this idea that there must be some sort of stuff, <laughs> really, you know, something intrinsic nature to to to, uh, to to reality. It can't all that all that the physics and the rest of science does really is describe how stuff behaves, what it does, how it interacts, and so on. And this has been a focus when we've been talking about consciousness, of course, about you know, what effects does it have. And I'm all for this. You know, I think we I think we live in the world of of you know uh, um, uh, the, the, the interaction, uh, but still there is this intuition that has to be some sort of fundamental st stuff, and um, and so the idea is the, the, the panpsychist idea. Well, it's it's consciousness because that's a kind of that, that gives us we have this concept of this stuff that's really fundamental and intrinsic and kind of not just a matter of processes occurring. Okay, now um, now. You you said then that you know you don't just buy this purely mathematical physics isn't uh, the physics isn't just giving us purely mathematics it's describing the world it's describing reality which is you know it's not mathematical reality is well okay so what is reality then what is the what is the the ultimate stuff what is that 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 physics is describing or is that just a silly question is it does it just all bottom out in descriptions of dispositions of things uh, and that's all we can do. We can just say, it's... well, like, yeah, good. Actually, I think that you've, you've secretly connected back to the multiverse uh, question, mm -hmm. because what I would say is it doesn't just, we, we invoke reality, the real world, the physical world for good reasons. Mm -hmm. um, it, ultimately it's because you're trying to explain phenomena. Sure. But then you don't just say, it's just a black box I use to explain phenomena. You attribute reality to it. This is the same attitude I would have toward the multiverse. If you think that a framework in which there are many, many different regions of space where conditions are different, et cetera, et cetera, helps us understand the universe we observe, that's a good reason to put non-trivial credence in that, even if you can't observe those other regions of the universe directly. And likewise, for many worlds, it gives us a framework for complete. It, it's a predictive theory that predicts what we observe. So you should believe its predictions, even if even the predictions you can't directly test. Um, and so I think that I, I'm a reality realist. That's what I think is real, the real world, the physical world. And uh, it's not, you know, we use math to describe it. And we have all these different layers. And it's very interesting, full employment for physicists and philosophers and everyone else explaining how all these things fit together. Um, but the attribution of reality to the world is not uh, just by the by. It's, it's you know, it, it, it's there's a, a work being done by that. And do you, do you think there is a real question as to what it is that reality is fundamentally made of, as opposed to the fundamental descriptions of reality that we, that, that physics gives us? 
Yeah, so no. I, I think that ultimately there is a bottoming out, but the bottoming out is in physical reality. Like what exists, the physical world, what is it? It's the physical world. It's what it is. There's, I can't Im even imagine what it would be like to, to explain in terms of other things. Like, I mean, right. it has to bottom out somewhere. What better place than reality? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Final question. White Final Kidney question. says, uh, I think this is may maybe covered by things you've already talked about, but isn't it a bit premature attempting to define or discuss consciousness with our limited knowledge in regards to how the brain actually works? I guess this could apply to any anyone in this debate, actually. Maybe we're mm. too confident of our opinion in these early days. Well, I mean, I'm 100% in favor of theorizing about things we don't fully understand yet. I mean, that's what we do, right? We do our best job. I'm not saying that Aristotle should have shut up about, you know, the motion of arrows and things like that. It was good for him to think about those things. Newton didn't make a mistake uh, inventing a theory of the world just because he didn't know about relativity and quantum mechanics. We know some things about consciousness. It's not something that is completely a black box. We even know some things about the brain. So by all means, this is how science works. Conjectures and refutations, to quote a famous philosopher of science. Uh, we'll make some hypotheses. We'll think about how they fit together. We'll compare them to the data and we'll proceed. But we should do that within uh, the constraints of the core theory is an effective theory of the domain in which we we live well you know up to a certain credence so i mean let me let me i, I meant to say this but didn't get a chance you know philip is is appalled that i give a 95 percent credence to many worlds i would say look five percent is a lot of credence as a poker player five percent things happen all the time you yeah, know point, way too much and and yeah so likewise the core theory could very well be wrong even right. in the domain in which it's purportedly right there has okay. to be some credence to that again if you have an idea for why that might happen by all means win the nobel prizes please do not try to I'm deny that do not shy away from I think, it. i think what i would say is my my credence is very low in the, uh, in, the in the in the in the claim that introspection is going to provide such evidence Okay, well, <laughs> Sean, you've it's been you've been spending giving us a lot of time. It's been absolutely fantastic been great. discussion. I think I've learned a lot as well, actually. Not quite convinced, but you're getting there. You're getting there, Philip. He's getting maybe he's getting, getting there. there. In another couple of months. Yeah, and um, <laughs> let's continue the conversation. And um, yeah, let's do that. This is thank great. you so thank much. You very much. For having me on, this is a fun really, conversation. Really, 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 really great discussion. Thank you. It's nighttime Brilliant. where you are, so it's harder for you, but I appreciate <laughs> it. Yeah, I'm starting to flag. Thank you very much, and thanks for engaging with philosophy so much that not oh, everybody does. Yeah. Thanks for your patience. Thanks, Sean. Bye. Okay, that was a bit of a mammoth, wasn't it? Good. I enjoyed it. I hope it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> well, how long have we talking? Mammoth. That's not the right word, is it? Three. Three mammoth. hours. Oh, I wonder if anyone's has anyone stuck hours. with us through the whole through the whole thing. Um, yeah, it's gone down a bit actually, but uh, yeah, there's still well, bravo to, it, to to those of you who have. I hope you enjoyed well, it. That was yeah, that was really good. That was I think yeah, that was. Um, I think I learned a lot there actually, which is I think we're getting better at this too, Keith. I think we're. I, I, yeah, I think I think we are. We we've. Um, I, I, I think, well, it's, it's for others to say, it's for the, it's for, for the people watching to say. The question is, I mean, the danger is, of course, it. that we get fascinating guests on and we just want to talk to them ourselves. And, you know, I'm bursting to say things and you're bursting to say things and we follow our own interests and maybe we sometimes forget about the listeners. So I don't know, maybe the listeners find it interesting to see us having these these, these ding dong things. Um, but uh, well, you, you, we are doing a better job. You're doing a better job of bring it, keeping it, bringing it back to the listeners and um, to the viewers and uh, reminding. You, you, you were most most heated against me today. I thought, I thought uh, that was uh, you were very <laughs> strong. I was. I was. Oh my god! What's going it's on? All, it's all in good. It's all in good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Quite passionate there. I think. Yeah. Well, I get, get a bit passionate sometimes, and I can't just sit here sort of being 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 all. Uh, soft and cuddly all the time. I've got to, I've got to yeah, <laughs> a bit of fire in my belly, you're, haven't I? You're very cuddly. Uh, <laughs> I 
<laughs> I noticed um, people on the chat saying that you sound like Ringo Starr. I, I, oh yeah, it's a soft Liverpool accent that, uh, yeah. Um, and and your from... peace and love, of course. And yeah. I, I I do believe in peace and love. You yeah, do. And you are a rock star, guess, so, so yeah. it, it, it all fits yeah. together. You, you've, actually, you've got your band back together, so yeah. Me, me and Lex Friedman on his podcast, we, we might play some Beatles songs, actually. We've oh. been talking about it. We both do a bit of music on the side. and That'd be lovely. But, uh, I've never heard you play. I've, I've never heard you. Uh, that good, really. Are you, are you um, a punk? Is it punk? You, you're a punk man. You were a punk man. You are a punk um, man. Guitar Explorations of the Human Condition. Right. right, punk, in other words. It's a bit sort of <laughs> eccentric indie. But uh, we're going to talk about the Phil Paper survey a little bit, won't we? Then, oh, uh... okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, this this survey of philosophers' opinions um, on philosophical matters. Do you believe yes. in God? Do you, What do you think about the mind? Do we have free will? And, um, and the results are in, and our positions are the, the least popular of all on the mind. But uh, so well, well, it but depends, uh, what, depends what you could call my position. I thought um, uh, pan, um, eliminativism. Uh, right. So, but, but I'm not sure. I, I mean, functionalism gets quite a, yeah. a, a high figure, I think. And uh, you could characterize my position as functionalism as well. It's eliminativism about. So I'm not sure. I, mean, I take quite a lot of. Co I also. I see, yeah. I so, took, so there's so, a yeah. ambiguity there. The eliminativism was the least popular position at 4.5%, but you might say... Well, it didn't say illusionism, did it? But so, then the I mean, most popular position was functionalism, right? So that's 33%, I think, was it? What, what cheered me was to see that 30% that of people don't think there's a hard problem. Was that uh, right? I yep. That. Yep, I think so. And that's... I, I don't... I didn't have the figures for the last one, but I bet that's gone up. I don't remember seeing the question on is there a hard problem, was there? Well, I, unless I dreamt it. I... But so overall, just in case people are interested on consciousness, it's, so it's kind of roughly 50, just over 50% of philosophers accept or lean towards materialism or physicalism about the mind. 30, roughly 30, just over 30% oppose that. So, you know, substantial minority think that you can't account for the, the mind in materialist terms. And then 15 to 20 percent are sort of undecided or don't like the question or something. And then of the opponents of materialism, three quarters of them are dualists and one quarter are panpsychists. So panpsychism is you know very much the, the third view if you carve things up in that way. But I mean it's incredible that it's it wasn't even on the last survey. So from my perspective, you know, it's gone from being something that nobody took seriously, hardly anybody to being, um, you know, one of the views on the table. Well, you, 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 it's very much I, third place if you think, you know, it's the most it's dualism. the most harmless form of dualism. Of I know you don't think of it as dualism, but it's the most harmless form of non-physicalism. You know, because yeah, yeah. you know you tuck it away nicely in this limbo, so it doesn't do any doesn't doesn't do any doesn't do any harm to anything. And then we can just cancel cancel through. You know. <laughs> I'm not going to be drawn. So, so, so you think? So, what were people voting for when they voted for eliminativism? Then the um... I don't really know. I mean, uh, uh, it wasn't specif exactly specified. Was it was quietly on eliminativism or consciousness eliminativism? I, I mean, I think those are mm -hmm. rather different p positions. I mean, the, if you uh, the, the claim that consciousness, you know, consists in quietly, it is quite a substantive, and I think. Uh, um, you know, uh, 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 it's just standard substantive claim that I would challenge. So, I, 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 if you ask people, do you think consciousness doesn't exist? Then not many people are going to say yes. But if you say, do you think there's a Cartesian theory where you know Qualia are projected to some sort of inner self? Then I think you're going to. Get... So it's all about how you frame these questions, isn't it? There was an interesting paper that um, that, uh, that I commented on. Um, I can't remember the names of all the authors. It was on the Brains blog um, about how uh, the uh, the terminology used in um, uh, it, it was about the zombie argument and how if you frame the question using the word zombie, then you, you know you tend to get the sort of intuition that you, the, the, the non-physicalist intuition. But if you uh, phrase it in terms of, sort of a duplicate, which is then specified to sort of have the lights off inside, you don't get the same. Um, the, 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 the effect is much less. So how you phrase these questions is is. Particularly in a survey thing like That's this, interesting, yeah. it's very, it's very right. uh, 
Uh, I, mean, I, I think the term zombie does, you know, I think it, it, it plays a role in, in helping us form the concept of consciousness that is particularly problematic. You know, you can think of, of some sort of essence that is, that is absent despite all the functions being performed. Yes, just as you could think of there being some vital spirit that is uh, present or absent uh, regardless of the biological processes, independent of the biological process. You can, you can form that conception. The question is whether it's a good conception. Um, one that, 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 so, uh, I, I mean, I don't. What do you think about surveys? Do you think do you think these surveys are? I mean, they're kind of interesting, but do you think they we learn much from them? Well, Part I mean, ultimately, we should, ultimately, we should be interested, obviously, in what what reasons and arguments and evidence there are, and it you know it doesn't matter what 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 the majority thinks. But no, I think it's important and interesting to. Um, Natesh Ganesh in the comments asking, wonder what these poll figures would look like if the same question was posed to scientists. Interesting question. Mm, uh, mm. But then you see you're asking people who aren't experts on this topic and uh, who are often, you know, taken to be experts on philosophical topics, but might not have read all the... Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it is important because, you know, I think sometimes you get, you get, if you read atheist blogs or if you read religious blogs you might get impression in the former case in one case that this fine-tuning stuff totally proves the existence of god on the other case this fine-tuning stuff is a load of nonsense i mean a lot of atheist blogs do say the fine-tuning is just bunk bunk is that the word but actually on the fine-tuning question there was no consensus absolutely no and in fact god was a bit more bit more popular than design uh, sorry a bit more popular than the multiverse, which surprised me. So, you know, it's useful to know what, you know, I would say, I take acad academia seriously, what the academic who spend their time, their life reading what everyone thinks, thinking about it, working on it, talking to people, having their view torn apart by an audience, what they think on these matters is not the final word, but it's important data, you know. I, yeah, I mean, I, I wonder what we're tracking though. I mean, I mean, philosophy has a sort of dynamic and a history all of its own. Um, uh, which is to s some extent uh, self-generating. Um, I mean, yes, of course, we, we we do read beyond. Hopefully, we do read beyond the, the subject. But there are fashions and trends within philosophy that uh, that come and go, um, seemingly by, by according to some yeah. sort of internal logic, I, I, which I don't understand, or you know, just fashion. And if that's all we're tracking, and a lot of people do think there's no real progress in philosophy, I don't agree with that myself. Oh, there shouldn't be. I mean, I think the the the, the only sort of philosophy in which there's no progress is bad philosophy. Um, but I wonder, are we just tracking fashions here, um, as you might they might track fashions in, say, I don't know, playing chess or the openings that are fashionable at one time or another, or are we tracking some? You know, are we actually tracking some progress towards towards the truth? And um, okay, yeah. I'm not sure. Digital gnosis is saying I'm an atheist and I think fine tuning stuff is nonsense. So yeah, of course, you know, it doesn't settle anything. All I, I suppose all I was saying was if people are getting the impression that this is what everyone thinks, this is what the experts think. And actually it turns out the people who, I mean, it, are there experts in philosophy? You know, everything's controversial, but it's still interesting what, you know, people who have spent you know, are paid to spend a lot of time looking at what everyone in the present moment and throughout history have thought of this, what they end up thinking is is significant data. It's not the final, especially if, I mean, it's interesting where there is consensus, like with compatibilism. I'm not a compatibilist, actually, but it's it's an interesting fact that there's significant consensus around that, especially if you, you know, read Sam Harris and you think, actually, you know, Everyone thinks free will doesn't exist. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe that's a bit unfair to Sam Harris. He has interesting things to say on these topics. But anyway, I think what would be really interesting though is to, is, is to have a is to have a survey of how philosophy uh, is how philosophical ideas are being um, uh, feeding through into 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 the wider. Uh, I was going to say educated public. Perhaps I shouldn't. I mean, what you know, what science? What how scientists are reacting to what's happening in philosophy? Yeah. Because. I mean, if, if all we're doing is tracking internal trends and internal fashions, then, you know, I mean, it, these things have got to be evaluated in a wider context if they're to be of any, you know. Some, yeah. Some, you know, so if it's more than just chess playing that we're doing, uh, if it's really getting to, you know, to grips with with with, with the nature of reality, uh, yeah. then 
it should interest people outside and and th their reaction should be more significant than ours right? because if there's if the ideas are coming up that people outside philosophy are finding useful and interesting see, and that illuminates stuff that helps me to think about things uh, in this area as in pure maths i mean pure maths proceeds according to its own logic but then it becomes applied because people see that insights from pure maths can be applied in various ways and i think that you know, applied philosophy that's what we should be kind of tracking what what's what's getting some traction with people you know in the real world as it were um, it's easy for us to think that, you know, following through us, uh, you know, the, the, uh, a particular, you know, an argument in the journals that's going back and forth and contributing to it, that that's, uh, uh, that that's you know, it's easy to see it as self, um, self-validating. And I don't sure. Yeah. Yeah. And especially when philosophers don't make enough effort to communicate and get these things out. And yeah, no, I, I think we can yeah, agree yeah. on it. Katka Slutova is saying, I think it's very special two philosophers who have a different opinion about consciousness discussed together. Oh, so, yeah. which is very sweet. Uh, very nice. Thank you. And um, yeah, I mean, there are lots of things we do agree on, don't we, Keith? Despite that, I think, <laughs> you know, there, I think one thing we, we always do tend to agree on is, you know, that consciousness is wherever it is and nowhere else. I'm never going to get the hang of this. Next time, I'm going to be bang on the money. I promise. 